Good morning. Please sit down. I can imagine that you didn't have enough time to, to talk with each other last night, but I promise you there's another night to come. So uh, uh, there's a lot of time, and in between there is also a lot of time, but some, somewhere in between we have also our formal moments because we have to share so much. But like I told Lev yesterday, I think every topic of our program of, uh, of these days uh, needed, in fact, a whole week. So maybe we have to sit together for half a year or something like that. And even then, I'm wondering that we, uh, that we can finish everything. But uh, good to see you back. So most of you arrived, at least. That's very important at the morning of the, of the second uh, day. And I can imagine, because we have such an important program, we talk today um, about our important partner in, in our daily work, the police. We all know how important the police is in society and what's even more important is how we can work with, uh, with, them, uh, with them together. Um, the main purposes of, of, of the police in democratic society governed by the rule of law are very important items. I think you all know them, but I repeat them. To maintain public tranquility and law and order in society, to protect and respect the individual fundamental rights and freedoms as enshrined notably in the European Convention of Human Rights, to prevent and combat crime, to detect, to detect crime, and to provide assistance and service function to the public. We all can understand that this is the paragraph of uh, part of the European Code of Police Ethics, and I believe it's captured the essence of what it's, it means to be a police officer in a democratic society. Unfortunately, the policing profession sometimes loses, because of all the work they have to do, sight of what I believe is the most challenging element of their work, to protect and respect the individual's fundamental rights and freedoms as enshrined, notably in the European Convention on Human Rights. Police leaders, I think, must ensure that the officers fully understand the nature and significance of the commitment this brief phrase suggests. It commits the police to a pact with the community they serve. Finally, public confidence in the police is closely related to the attitudes and behavior towards the public, in particular their respect for human dignity and individual fundamental rights and freedoms as enshrined notably in the European Convention. And I stand before you today to address for us the most important topic that requires our attention and action. Improving the position of victims within the police force. Victims of crimes are entitled to justice, support and a voice in the criminal justice process. It's our social thoughts duty to ensure that they have a better standing within the law enforcement apparatus. I would like to highlight a few key points that can contribute to achieving these necessary points in our work. First of all, recognition and empathy. We know victims deserve recognition for what they have endured. It's crucial for police officers to approach them with empathy, understanding the emotional impact of the crimes and treating victims with respect. The second point is empowerment of rights. Victims should be fully informed about their rights within the judicial system, the, the criminal justice system. The police should provide them with information about available support and legal options, enabling them to make informed decisions. The third one is accessibility and availability. Victims must have easy access to the police and emergency services. We can think of all kinds of uh, situations that it's still difficult for victims to arrive there. Fourth is the professional training and development. In order to effectively assist victims, police officers, I think, need to be trained in recognizing trauma and providing appropriate support. Training in victim assistance should be integrated in the complete education and ongoing professional development of law enforcement personnel. 
Then we have the collaboration and partnerships. It's very crucial for the police to collaborate with other agencies. I always say in the Netherlands, the police doesn't have to do it alone because we are there. And I always ask, what do you, what do you want from us as victim support organization? But I still see that the police is so respons responsible for everything they have to do that sometimes times they don't even ask, but we are there. And it's so important to realize that we are there and that we have the knowledge how to talk with victims uh, about what the needs are of the victims and whatever we can, uh, we can do. It, I think it should make the police work more easy when they recognize us uh, also all the time. Uh, the last point I want to make is, is empowerment and participation, because I think what's so important is that victims should be encouraged to participate in the criminal justice process. I think too often you see that there is spoken about victims, but not with victims. And it's so important that they, they are able to explain what their really needs are, because every victim is unique and their needs are unique. Dear colleagues, it's our collective responsibility to provide victims of crime with the support and justice they deserve. By strengthening the position of victims within the police, we can establish a system in which they are treated with respect and empathy. Today, our conference program is dedicated to the police work with victims, in particular the challenges of balancing respect for fundamental rights, protecting security and developing a victim-sensitive police service. A range of topics will be addressed during today, such as empathetic treatment of victims, what is it, how achieve it, victim-centric police investigation, community policing, innovation in police training, etc. Police work is far from easy these days, we all know in this complicated society, but I think that victim support organization can relieve that work. If we call on each other expertise in timely manner, insight into our knowledge and skills, as well as confidence in our added value is of great importance. The police don't have to do it alone. I think that this conference is a wonderful platform for that. And I have every confidence that we will have a fruitful discussion today and share best practices from around the world. But before we start to do that, uh, I'd like to invite and to give the floor to our guest from South Korea, from our um, sister organization, Victim Support Asian, to stand here and um, give their speeches uh, to us and share how their experience from your organization. Please, do you want to enter? And I First, I want to give the floor to Mr. Yong Wu Ling, president and founder of Victim Support Asia. Good morning. Korean, 안녕하세요. Victim Support Bureau. Members are Santa Cruz to the victim. This again, I want to speak to thank you on behalf of all the crime victims. It is very nice to, to meet everyone in person again. I am very happy to have this opportunity to speak today. Fundamental rights are one of the most important roles of government in protecting individual rights, freedoms, and right. These fundamental rights should be aimed and protecting human dignity and human rights. 
polishing is critical to pro help protecting and maintaining these fundamental rights. Polishing is above maintaining the faith to and peace of individuals and society. This is the by preventing crime in violence and arresting and punishing criminals, policing protect personal safety and freedom. This is constant with the protection of fundamental rights. Also, if policing if maintained the safety and stability of society are maintained and crime and violence are reduced the economy develops and the safety and stability of society increase. This is in the interest of all people. However, maintaining public order requires active participation and cooperation from people as well as the rule of government. People should actively participate in reporting crimes and violence and arresting criminals. Also, socially responsible action should be taken to prevent crime. In conclusion, policing is important to protect and maintain fundamental rights. This requires both the government and people to actively partition to prevent and deal, deal crime and violence. I believe that all victims of crime caused by the failure of fundamental rights have their right to demand bond reset. The conversation from government and society. Although there are differences in government, abolish and religious culture in the world, we are trying very hard so that the victims can return to our society with the development of victim support Europe and the revitalization of victim support Asia. I hope the day that we can smile together will come soon. Hope and courage for all the victims. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee, for your important work. I think what we what we recognize in your uh, in your speech is that you face uh, the same problems as everywhere else in uh, in the world. But I know that you work very hard in uh, in realizing uh, victim rights in uh, in South Korea and in, in the whole of Asia. And maybe I I can take this moment to uh, to 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 give you back something I learned in South Korea when I was there a few years ago is because I think you are going even faster with your developments that we can speed up with. And I remember that on that moment, you had a development that they had developed a sort of a chip in an uh, Apple Watch. Because, and what, what has that to do? As you know, a lot of victims are afraid that they meet their suspects in um, a shop or in wherever they walk around in the garden in, in whatever they, uh, they are, but it's difficult to detect all the time where, where uh, your perpetrator uh, is. 
and in South Korea they had developed an, a very little chip you could put in your uh, in your um, phone or in your watch, and you knew on every moment uh, when, of course, you wanted yourself because that's very important. This with consent of uh, of victims, um, you can see where the other one is when he is out of prison. I found that a very interesting development, and I must say I was very impressed that you already had developed this because in the Netherlands it took us at least three times to try to copy this beautiful uh, instrument. And But I can tell you that on this moment in the municipality of Rotterdam, we have a pilot and it works. So and I, I find it a, a great example. Of course, there were more of these beautiful examples, but I want to share this, uh, this, this one. Thank you very much. And then I give the word to Mrs. Uh, Lees. Vice President of Victim Support Asia. Please take the floor. Good morning. <laughs> uh, dear PSC members, I'm Hak Suk Kim from South Korea. Uh, it's an honor to be here with experts from the EU to discuss the policy of supporting crime victims. I have worked as a prosecutor in Korea for 23 years, and I have played a role in relieving the injustice of crime victims. Uh, now I am working as a lawyer. In 2008, when I worked as a prosecutor at the Ministry of Justice, I was in charge of Korea's crime victim support policy. At that time, I was working on full revision of crime, the Crime Victims Protection Act in Korea, which greatly improved the rights of crime victims by referring to EU legislation. Because EU policy is the standard of the world, uh, in my opinion. This is my fifth attendance since I first attended the BSC meeting in 2015. The BSC conference is an ex exemplary model for Asian countries. It is the dream of Asian countries to have a system in which EU citizens can lead, receive victim support for criminal damage within the EU, regardless of location. In the end, in 2019, with Yongori, Organizations that agreed to support victims in Asia gathered to establish an organization called BSA. As soon as established, it was suspended due to the COVID-19 crisis. But we are continuing our meeting to webinar. Asian countries differ in almost every field, including religion, political form, race, GDP, and victim support policies. Financial programs are serious too. The UN is also preparing its own crime victim support program, so it seems to be increasingly uh, difficult to receive support from the UN in the future. I don't know if it's almost impossible for BSA to be like a BSE but we'll move forward step by step. Base member, Lev and Frida uh, are helping us a lot. I think there's a way for BSC and BSA to collaborate in different areas. Next year, I hope to see you with improved uh, performances. Thank you to BSC and advising members for inviting us. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Mr. Kim. And I think on behalf on, uh, of, of VSC, I think we are very willing to, to cooperate and uh, to, uh, to exchange a lot of experience. So you're welcome everywhere. And we will be there. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Lee and Mr. Kim. Thank you. Okay, and then we go on with our program, and I give the floor to uh, to Yule. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you to Mr. Lee and Mr. Kim. Um, we've been working together now, I think, nine years. I think um, what Vic Victor and Sport Asia has done and what, what, what they've done together as well is just uh, the epitome of what VSC and this, this kind of conference really represents. And uh, it's, it's you just hear a little bit about what they've done, but they, we've been working together with all of the organizations. Uh, and it, it comes down to the very specifics of um, having European victims supported in Asia because of the connections that we have responding to the Indonesian terrorist attacks and having those connections. Uh, we learn from you, you learn from us. So I, th I think this is really an important partnership. We're really lucky this morning as well to have two other uh, important partnerships as well, which reflects not only the work uh, with support services, but the work with police. I won't go into the all of the details. Uh, Rosa has already explained it. I'm going to move things on very quickly, but I really appreciate all the work that we've done together. So now, uh, it's my very distinct pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who is Professor Ben Bradford. He's our esteemed colleague from uh, the Global City Policing at the Department of Security and Crime Science at the University College London. He's an amazing speaker. I've heard him before. Uh, he's going to be talking about the crucial topics of policing, ethics, and the preservation of fundamental rights. So without further ado, Ben, I hope you're clear. There he is. <laughs> yeah, just, to, just to demonstrate we're not all from the EU, unfortunately, which, which I hardly need to repeat this disaster for my country and relief for the rest of the EU. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks very much for, for the invitation. I'm slightly overwhelmed by the number of people. It's fantastic to see so many people post-COVID, I guess. It's great to be out. Uh, um, I've got slides, because I'm, I'm an academic, so I can't possibly say anything that's very slow. Um, so I'll try and wade when to cycle through them, which will be quite fast. But at least what I'm going to say is written, also written down. Um, that makes things a bit easier. So I've been asked to come and talk about um, policing ethics and fundamental rights. I feel like a bit of an interloper, because I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a moral philosopher. I don't know much about fundamental rights. Um, I do know a bit about policing, a bit about policing ethics, so that's where I'm going to focus. Um, next slide, please. I want to do um, four things in 20 minutes. Yeah, um, that's good. Good start. Um, uh, what rights and how fundamental are these rights when we're thinking about the relationship between police and obviously victims? But I think everything I'm going to say applies in multiple wide contexts between policing and those who police officers encounter. So think about that. I want to introduce the idea that policing should be construed as and can be when it's done well. Um, a rest of recognition in, in that sort of honest sense. Um, I'll introduce a talk, lead, lead that onto a discussion of the relational nature of procedural justice, which is a concept I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but we're going to have to do um, a bit, bit of a revision on that. And then I'm going to give you a worked example. So I'm an empirical social scientist. I'm not comfortable if I'm, not, as I'm saying things with data, so I've got a bit of data sitting here which I can give you to help you with um, airy fairy claims. Next slide, please. Is that better? Ah, I can hear myself now. Um, we've already heard, when we, talk, when we think about uh, policing and human rights, we often turn to the Human Rights Act. It was encoded in British law, the Human Rights Act, uh, 1998. Um, the convention rights are here on the screen. We're all very familiar with these. Um, I think one of the things we don't often think about enough in these kinds of contexts is there are only three absolute rights in the Human Rights Act. Uh, the rights against, uh, against torture, slavery, and the right to a fair trial. All the rest are limited or qualified. And from a lay perspective, one of the most surprisingly limited rights is the right to life. The state can transgress the right to life if it chooses to do so, if it feels necessary to do so. Which is the institution empowered with doing that? It's the police. Similarly with qualified rights. The right to assembly, right to free speech, these are qualified. They have to be weighed up against the rights of others. Should they have, have their own free speech? Should they have some privacy to their right to assemble? These are not absolute rights. Who is the institution charged with deciding which rights, whose rights are in play, and whose are prioritised? Very often the police. The police threaten a 
as well as protect our rights. And that's even by design. That's even before we start thinking about, um, for example, the news that came out of Italy yesterday of five police officers charged um, with the regulation of treatment against um, immigrants and homeless people. Um, the human rights framework gives us a necessary but not sufficient set of criteria for thinking about the question of fundamental rights and policy. We need to do more. We need to go further afield. Um, where can we go to? Well, you know, and again, I'm an empirical social scientist. I would go to social theory. And we might want to say that policing is, as well as human rights, um, concerned with the following types of rights. Rights, restitution and restoration, very clearly a um, victim. Procedural justice, I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. Distributive justice, we should be able to expect that the goods and positions of policing are evenly distributed across different groups in society. We could think about things like non-domination. Again, I'll say a, a brief word about that later on. Um, but what I want to do is hang this discussion um, off, a, off a paper actually by Pemberton and colleagues, I'm sure, sure some of you are familiar with it, from a few years ago, who identify the relevance of the big two, as it's called in psychology, of agency and community for victims' experiences, and again, people's experiences of, of policing much more widely. Um, agency and communion lie at the bottom of social judgment. The way we experience, judge, and respond to social interaction of the kinds we have with police officers when we're reporting crimes to them. And there's a large body of psychological literature that suggests that agency and communion shape the way we go through these processes. What do these words mean? You know, two fundamental, I'm quoting now, two fundamental modalities in the existence of living forms. Agency for the existence of an organism as an individual, and communion for our participation of the individual in some larger organism of which the individual is part. Just a bit, a bit, bit more flesh on those bones. Agency, agency relates to intellectual desirability, instrumentality, independent self-construal. It relates to ourselves as independent agentic actors, as individual people who can do things in the world. Communion relates to social desirability, consideration, expressiveness, nurturance, and to an interdependent self-construal. Our sense, the sense that we can only be ourselves in relation to others, and particularly in relation to social groups of which we feel we belong. And it's very clear, and Pemberton and colleagues make this, and it's pretty fairly evident, I think, um, that victimization is an attack on both agency and communion. And it seems self-evident to me that policing should seek to mitigate that attack, to do something about the attack that's been made on people's sense of themselves, and their sense that they belong to wider social groups. Um, how can policing meet this challenge? Well, a number of different ways, but broadly speaking, by recognition. Again, in Axel Honneth's sense, there's a large body of, of moral philosophy about this. What do we mean by recognition? We mean demonstration of these things. We've already heard some of these words today. Respect for the equal dignity of rights-bearing individuals. Esteem for valued membership of salient social categories. And for two words we're not necessarily familiar with in, in the context of policing, love and friendship, this is usually meant to mean the maintenance of trust-based relationships. And that's obviously vital. You can't be respected by someone, you can't be esteemed by someone if you don't trust them. So trust lies at the, the bedrock of the relationship between policing and all members of the community, but perhaps most importantly, victims. So policing that recognizes victims in these ways can help restore lost agency and communion. That's, that's the argument. Or at the very least, and this is the least we should expect, not undermine them further than they already have been. And the key point, I think, and this is sometimes lost in these kinds of discussions, and certainly missed by police officers, is this is experiential and cognitive. Policing affects the way that people think and feel about themselves, where they fit in society, their sense of, literally their sense of self. And police officers, I think, too often lose sight of that and lose sight of the effect they have on the way people think about themselves. This is where the idea of, of procedural justice comes in. Um, again, I'm sure many of you have heard of this phrase, but very, very briefly, there's a huge bo body of evidence that suggests that when people are interacting with anyone with power over them, so it could be a teacher, it could be an employer, it could be a parent, in this case, a police officer, they're looking for particular things in those interactions to pursue justice. They're looking for neutrality, are decisions made in an unbiased fashion. They're looking for respect, do I feel respected by this person? They're looking for voice. Do I, do I have my say and I can put my side of the story? Do I think this person's listening to me? Do I think they're going to act on what I'm saying? 
and they're looking precisely through these things for trustworthiness. Can I trust this person? Are they going to do the same, the things they say they do? Well, almost wherever we look in the world, actually, um, we find procedural justice effects. This is a fundamental way in which people judge their interactions with police officers and judge policing more widely. And I think one of the, sort of, if we think about why procedural justice is so important, why do people say pay so much attention to it, it's pretty clear um, that there's just this very, very widespread normative expectation that this is how people with power should behave. Procedural fairness, fairness is in that sense a prescriptive ought. We just, we just we've been socialised through a whole variety of mechanisms to believe this is the way people should be acting. And we respond very positively, more positively when we're treated in this way, we respond very, very negatively when we're not treated in these kinds of ways. But we can go further than this and think about some of the other reasons why procedural justice is so important to people, which makes a link into this idea of recognition. So process fairness, for one thing, provides reassurance that the unobservable characteristics of an interaction are themselves um, appropriate, being, appropriate being, con being conducted in an appropriate manner. When a victim reports a crime to the police, usually, that may very well be the first time they've ever done that, they're entering a process they're very unfamiliar with, a lot of that process goes on out of their sight, out of their experiences, but they can make an inference about the quality of that process um, by the way they're treated by a police officer and by the sense of trust that's developed through appropriate treatment. This leads into what is actually quite fundamental to the concept of procedural justice, a sense of control over the process. Particularly it's voice elements, when you're given a voice, when you're allowed to have your say, when, you people, when you're, people are listening to you, this gives you a sense of control in a situation, remember, where you don't really have very much control at all, very often. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, the psycho so social psychological mechanism underpinning procedural justice is all to do with shared gamesmanship. So on this account, police officers represent social groups that people find important, most people find important, community, nation, state, just belonging, if you like. And police officers as representative of those groups, when they treat people fairly, communicate status, belonging, and kin from those groups. So we, we generate self-worth self -worth from those kinds of experiences. Procedural injustice does the reverse. It excludes, it marginalizes, it pushes out, which is one reason why people respond so strongly to it. I'm gonna skip over this slide um, in the interest of time, just to say, um, the moral philosophers look at this question as well increasingly, um, and they, they see procedural justice um, as a way of ensuring um, that differential power and authority and status attached to, to members of power hierarchies like police officers. What procedural justice does is kind of ensure that this power is not being wielded in an arbitrary, um, kind of dominating fashion, it's being wielded in appropriate ways that, that, that signal social similarity and status between police officers and uh, ex-victims of crime which means there must be other normative values in play here. It's not all about procedural justice. We actually heard some of, about some of those values already today. Often in these conversations, we kind of default to the position that it's all about process fairness. There are other things going on. I'm going to ignore that now and just talk about process fairness for the last five minutes um, of the talk. This is where the empirical example comes in. So this is using um, brand new data um, from a survey of rape victims um, so it's, I'm, I'm slightly overwhelmed by dealing with this kind of data. In my line of work, we don't usually deal with data collected from people who've experienced crimes with this level of seriousness. So I'm treading very carefully here. Um, this is a survey of victims of rape conducted for the Obstetria Bluestone project in the UK. UK colleagues will be very familiar with this, I'm sure. It's a really, really major piece of research into the way that police, that rape is policed, investigated in the UK. So thanks to my, my colleague, Catherine Hull, um, who's academic lead on the project for allowing me to talk about this data today. And of course, the wider, the wider context here in the UK, and much more widely, I suspect, um, is a long-standing systematic failure to deal appropriately with rape and sexual policy. And for a whole host of reasons I probably don't need to go into, this is a major, major issue in the UK. And Opsoteria Bluestone is trying to turn some of that around, and there is some evidence that it's starting to turn some of that around. I can't really tell you about, I'm not going to give you any numbers, which is probably a relief to most of you in the room, um, because we're still actually still collecting data, we're still working on, on the analysis. But I can give you some kind of top line findings so we can see how some of these things I've been talking about play out when we go to the experiences of real people who've experienced an incredibly serious crime. So there's a 1,100 rape victims uh, stories and analysis. 
And what we could do, what we have done, is generate a simple model um, which reflects, in a sense, what I've just been telling you. So we could have people's or victims' experiences of procedural justice as the case unfolded. We could measure that. We've, so we have measured that with survey questions such as the officers in my case understood what it was like, were kind, uh, were respectful, took my needs into account, explained things well, were easy to get hold of, contacted me in good time, and so forth. And all those things very, very clearly measure, in some sense, procedural justice. And then we can say that procedural justice is linked in some kind of causal fashion, probably is causal fashion, actually, to what we could characterise loosely as agency and communion. So agency is police made me feel that I had some control over what happened. Like I matter, like I was comfortable, I was safe. Police and, and community is measured by questions like police made me feel what happened to was, me was serious, that society was on my side, that officers care about me, that I was believed, that I was listened to, I was reassured. So what happens when we confront that model with data? If you go to the next slide, and this is my one bit of animation, which is justifying the slides, uh, it, it all together. If you go to the next slide, ah, there we go. That's the, that's the model. We could front that model with the data. We click one through again, once again. And what happens is all those questions collapse down into one underlying construct. People are not drawing any distinction between procedural justice, between agency and communion. They are, in some psychological sense, the same thing to the people in the survey. What this suggests to me is, in some senses, the medium is the, mes is the message. Experience procedural justice is, in a sense, the same thing as experiencing agency and communion during this process. A sense of control, a sense of validation, of being listened to, of belonging. And I think it's fairly clear, to me at least, that victims and others have a fundamental right to expect this from the police. I have to say, only relatively rarely do they get it in the UK, but that doesn't discount from the idea that they, have a, they should have a fundamental right to get this from their experiences of policing. So policing is, in this sense, about recognition. And procedural justice is police practice that constitutes recognition of victims as rights-bearing, as members of a community, as members of society, as agentic, as equals to the figure of the police officer and therefore much wider figures in society. This is policing that may promote restoration, reintegration, belonging, agency, and at the very least, and I think this is probably more realistic, at the very least, doesn't, uh, doesn't undermine these even more than they already have with wider experience of victimization. I just want to close um, with a couple of, of, of caveats. It's like the, the, the limitations section at the end of an academic paper. Um, as I've suggested, it's not all about procedural justice. Part of this is about effectiveness and efficiency in the investigation, for example. And these categories bleed into, one each, into each other. So one of the things that victims find important, we know, is being contacted in good time, the police being easy to contact, police doing what they're going to say they're going to they're gonna do, um, they're going to phone you next week, the phone call arrives, explaining, that, explaining what's going on. These are core components of procedural justice, but they also speak to effectiveness, efficiency. These things can be very blurred. We could think about the extent to which police observe the boundaries of their authority. Some of the big issues we have in the UK is police seizing, I use that word advisedly, seizing the phones of victims of serious crime and keeping them for months and months. This is police overstepping the boundaries of their authority. They should not have the authority to do that because it undermines people's sense of agency, having their life taken away from each other. The second proviso is that this is not and should not be a consolation prize. And there's a danger it becomes a consolation. When, victim, when prosecution rates, successful prosecution rates for rape are, I think, 1.5%, there's a danger that this is seen as, well, we just give up on prosecution. We're never going to get successful prosecution. But we can do this and we make people feel better. That's not what we're saying. This is this just a SOP, standard operating procedure. This is just the way the police should treat people, and that should be as well as, not instead of, all the other outcomes processes the police need to engage in. And the final point is again, it's relating back to the statistics in a sense. This does all relate to effects at me, which is what we're all saying, statistics. Individuals may and do react very differently to the ways I've been describing here because they're individuals. But taken as a whole, there's an overwhelming amount of evidence that as a whole, people respond to police procedural justice in the kinds of ways that I've 
talked about. I think my last slide said any questions and stuff, but I don't think we have time for that, so, so thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Ben. I think that was, uh, I, th I think that's an example of, of what we need from academics, quite frankly. Often uh, in the academic world, people can be lost in research for research's sake, but I think there you brought together the, uh, the rights-based framework, the theoretical framework, and, and put that together with the practice. It was extremely clear. Uh, Victim Sports Europe recently published its Safe Justice paper, which is really following a lot of the um, issues and topics that you're talking about. Uh, we don't call it procedural justice, we're talking about safe justice for victims, um, but very much based on, on the kinds of issues that you covered. Um, maybe bringing some of those theories now to practice, I have the absolute pleasure of uh, introducing our next guest speaker all the way from the US, uh, John Latani. Mr. Latani is currently serving as the president of the executive board of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and is the chief of Thomasville, Georgia Police Department. Um, just to say, Ben, uh, we're very happy getting 300. I think this is our, our largest conference so far. I was speaking to John yesterday, and he, he's uh, preparing for uh, their conference in San Diego, where they will have around 18,000. So uh, <laughs> just wait for Croatia next year. That's all I can say. So John has an extensive experience and uh, made an invaluable contribution to the fields of law enforcement. He's been a driving force in the crucial area of community trust policing, uh, trust building, sorry. And what he'll be talking uh, today about is and providing his insight and expertise on fostering trust within our community. So over to you, John. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, it is wonderful to have 300 here. 18,000 is great, but 300 practitioners who are so passionate about this topic is a great audience, so thank you all for being here. So over the next few minutes, um, I hope to talk to you a little bit about um, the background of the IACP so you understand what the organization is, what we do, and how we, uh, how we work worldwide. Uh, I'll talk about the IACP's trust building campaign, give you some background on that. Um, we'll go into the IACP work and the resources in the victim services arena. Um, and then if we have some time, I'll, I'll give you a couple, uh, a couple examples. So. Uh, we'll start with our vision and our mission, because I think it's important for any organization to understand where they are, what they're doing, and where they're going. So our vision is shaping the future of the policing profession. Very simple, yet very profound. Um, there's a lot that goes into this, and, uh, and this is what we focus on day in and day out. So we do that through our mission, where we try to advance the policing profession through advocacy, research, outreach, and education. So all the things we do are around these four core areas. Our membership, uh, we have over 33,000 members in 170 countries around the world. So a very wide reach, um, a, a, a truly global uh, uh, focus on all the things we do. And, and while our name is the International Association of Chiefs of Police, uh, we're not all chiefs. Um, that is our core, but uh, we have law enforcement leaders from across the globe in all these different categories, but we have mid-level uh, leaders, line officers, university professors, students, private sector leaders, and of course, we have victim advocates and support professionals amongst our ranks. Our board, so you understand how we're constituted, so we have an elected uh, uh, executive board. It's elected by our membership, so there's about 15 members there, but we also have an additional 33 appointed members seven of which are our world regional chairs. That ensures that we have representation and, a, and, and input really from across the globe uh, because these world regional chairs uh, represent everywhere around the world and, and they're the ones that are uh, in, the, in the field that are bringing this information back to us. And we have several uh, ex officio members uh, with our federal partners, FBI, DEA. We have a very good relationship with uh, Interpol and then uh, we have several divisions I'll talk about in a second. So we are organized into policy councils, which is kind of a unique umbrella under which we coordinate efforts uh, amongst uh, our different working groups and so on. 27 committees, which uh, consist of 30 members each and at least 10%, three of those, have to be international, so we make sure we keep that perspective. 
One of our 27 committees is the Victim Services Committee. And I will tell you now, we have some openings on that uh, group, so I think we have four openings right now, and if anyone is interested, we are looking to fill out that roster and our others as well, so please uh, speak to me afterwards. We have 22 sections, um, which uh, are, are more topical based, so legal officer section, public information officer section, uh, police psychologist section, and so on. And then we have four divisions. So SACOP is our state associations of chiefs of police, that's US based. Uh, mid-size agencies, and then we have our state and provincial police, and of course the international division is one of our, one of our larger and, uh, and more focused ones. There's a lot on, uh, on this slide about our global policing initiatives, and I'm not going to read through all of that, but I do want to highlight a couple things that I think are, are uh, pertinent to our conversation here, um, just to show you a little bit about what we're doing around the globe. So um, aside from all the other things you see here, uh, we're working in the Dominican Republic on mi migrant smuggling operations and, and helping uh, those agencies deal with that problem. Uh, we're, uh, uh, we have had meetings in Ireland and Scotland, and we will have a meeting in about two weeks in Malta, and I understand we have representatives from all those countries here, uh, on, uh, on cultural transformation of the police. One of those is trust building, which I'll get to, and part of that is serving victims, so it all ties together. Uh, we have a project uh, uh, going in Nigeria on domestic and sexual gender-based violence investigation training. Of course, there's a large victim component to that. And then uh, we have a, a, a very important partnership with the Women's Justice Center in Mexico. Moving on to uh, some of our uh, partnerships and showing you kind of that, that global nature of, uh, of where we are. So this, there's a bunch of, of them on here, but a couple to highlight is we have a very good relationship with Interpol. Um, I'll be there next week for some meetings uh, in Lyon. And uh, we have a, an MOU with Europol that goes back almost 10 years now. And we're in the process of updating and revising that as well. Our offices, our, our main offices in Alexandria, Virginia, but we also have uh, offices in Abu Dhabi in the UAE. We have uh, an office in Seoul, South Korea. And uh, we're in the process of looking at some other offices around uh, the world. So. Uh, let me talk a little bit about what we've prioritized around this, uh, the, the victim service arena and, and trust building. Um, and so uh, we're trying to help our agencies and, and our members uh, build capacity to respond to gender-based violence crimes. We're trying to raise that awareness on the importance of creating fundamental changes by incorporating a victim-centered and trauma-informed approach while holding offenders accountable. Um, and that's a lot of what we've been talking about in the last uh, day and a half or so. Uh, because what we realize <clears throat> is that community trust and that victim center approach is it's interconnected uh, and it is mutually reinforcing. So establishing that community trust, it really is crucial to implement effective victim centered strategies. Uh, while victim center approaches help build and maintain, maintain community trust by prioritizing all those needs and rights that we, uh, we have talked about. So our trust building campaign. This campaign started last year. Um, it was kind of put together by a lot of individual things that we were doing uh, across our membership. Uh, and uh, what, we, what we decided to do uh, across the, the, uh, the board of officers is uh, focus on trust building over the next five years or so as the priority, as the umbrella under which everything else IACP does flows. And so, what this, uh, what this program does, and you can see it here, you know, we seek to enhance trust between a community and their police agency um, to promote safe, effective interactions and ensure police agencies and communities have the collective capacity to prevent and reduce crime and improve the overall well-being and quality of life for all. This is not only a police-focused approach. It's police and community together. And I think we all understand we have to work together and that while law enforcement can do certain things, our communities have to work together with the same focus, the same ideals, uh, and, and hopefully the, the, the same passion around uh, building trust and all the things that flow from that. So uh, what we're asking agencies to do is pledge to this campaign that over uh, the next three years, 36 months, uh, to implement key policies and promising practice in these six uh, key focus areas. Because we think these really are essential to enhancing trust and collaboration between law enforcement and its community. 
and you can see the six focus areas here, bias, uh, free policing, use of force, leadership and culture, recruitment, hiring, and retention, victim services, which obviously I highlighted because that's what we're talking about here today. And it is one of those six key components. And then, uh, of course, community relations is part of that. Uh, below here, this is a, a, a link. If you go to that website, uh, it tells you all about the trust building campaign. This is a very short video coming up, uh, about a minute, uh, minute and a half or so on the trust building campaign. Hello to all our members around the world. My name is John Letney, President of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. The IACP knows that the success of policing relies on the trust of the public and wants to support you in building that trust. Developing strong community police relations through open dialogue, transparency, and accountability helps police do their jobs and makes communities safer. I'm proud to continue the IACP's trust building campaign and encourage police leaders to demonstrate their commitment to enhancing trust between their agencies and the communities they serve. The campaign is thoughtfully centered around six key focus areas, bias-free policing, use of force, leadership and culture, recruitment, hiring, and retention, victim services, and community relations. Built into each of these focus areas are key policies and promising practices designed to encourage positive partnerships between communities and the police. Pledging to this campaign signifies your commitment to implement this guidance and promote safe interactions, develop effective crime reduction strategies, and improve well-being in your community. Upon demonstrating meaningful efforts related to all six focus areas, your agency will be publicly recognized for completing the pledge. I'm excited about the trust building campaign and the role it can play in enhancing the future of our policing profession. To join agencies around the world in these efforts, visit the Trust Building Campaign page on the IACP website and take the pledge today. So that's our message to our members. Uh, and there's so much more on the website. If you have some time, go to our Trust Building Campaign page uh, that you can get off the, off the main uh, site link or the QR code there as you saw. Uh, what we heard from Ben just a few moments ago is trust is the bedrock. Uh, it is foundational in being able to provide services to our communities. Um, and it looks different in different cultures and different places around the world, but it is fundamental to what we do. So how does that relate to victim services? Well, um, we've heard a lot about that in the last day and a half or so, about trust is so important. And having trust in a law enforcement agency uh, has so many more uh, outcomes that are positive when it comes to reducing crime, preventing crime, but then investigating crime, serving victims, and so on. Uh, so on, uh, on our uh, website, we have several resources to assist agencies in implementing these best practices that we're talking about. Um, and, and so part of that refers to training officers in trauma-informed responses. Officers need to know what it is, to some extent, that a victim is presenting themselves with, uh, and, and maybe to some extent what they've been through, so they can approach it appropriately and with, with compassion. Uh, training officers on best practices, resources, and tools for communicating with community members. So the victim understands that, uh, that the officer has some, at least some understanding, some empathy, some uh, um, belief in what they're saying. Uh, and, of course, we also find that it's important that uh, those who don't speak whatever our national language is, we have to be able to serve those folks as well and be able to communicate uh, even with those folks who uh, may have uh, a hearing deficit or something along those lines. So we have some resources on that as well. Um, and ultimately, we need to establish partnerships because the police can't do it all by ourselves. Uh, we are not the experts in everything. Um, there are other experts out there that we need to partner with in the mental health uh, field, substance abuse, uh, youth deflection, diversion, resources, and so on. And those are different for each community, but it's incumbent, we believe, on the agency to know what those resources are, develop those partnerships and those relationships so when it is appropriate and when it is helpful, they can reach out. So uh, enhancing law enforcement response to victims, uh, or ELERV as it's, uh, it's called, uh, is another 
resource that is available uh, on the IACP website. And so you can search this or, or click on this from our main page. And ELERV is um, it, it, it's designed around these four main areas, leadership, partnership, training, and performance monitoring. Uh, and again, it's another resource to try to help uh, um, law enforcement agencies understand the response to victims and their responsibility and what they can do within their law enforcement agency to provide a, a better level of service. And another quick video here to tell you a little bit about eLERV. Alerv essentially is community policing, taking the time to understand the individuals we encounter on every call and looking at the big picture of why we are there and who else we need to involve from the community, our community partners, to get to the root of the problem. The strategy is involving really some core principles that help guide law enforcement agencies in taking a holistic approach at learning how to improve their responses to victims and the people who live in their communities. The four core principle areas are leadership, partnering, training, and performance monitoring. Those four key principle areas are really great ways for agencies to take on this strategy and palatable measures with the resources that are existing. It doesn't matter whether you're a small agency that has 10 officers or whether you're a large agency that has 10,000. So that's the beginning of about a 15 minute video, uh, which obviously I don't have time to show you today, but the entire video as well as several others are on the eLERV website. It's very interactive. Uh, it has some questions, it has some things where you can uh, interact with, um, and it shows you a lot of resources and a lot of videos. So I encourage you to uh, take a look at that uh, when you have time. Uh, also, some publications that uh, we have available on our website. So a quick reference on victim services role, the quick re reference on getting started in a, a five-step process. We find that law enforcement, we like step-by-step -step things. We like organization, and it's easy for us to to, uh, to kind of use that kind of model. So, um, and we're trying to encourage agencies to develop this law enforcement based victim services model. Uh, so key considerations and a checklist on that and then a agency self assessment uh, and uh, accompanying assessment for our community. Because it's important for agencies to look within, see what they're doing well and where there are gaps, where they need to maybe uh, enhance their ability to serve. Uh, and do that hopefully through some of these uh, publications and other resources. Uh, we also have some very uh, uh, topic specific web pages. You can, you can see them here um, that help agencies, help uh, 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 law enforcement leaders understand and see a bigger picture beyond just their community and just their agency and look at really a global perspective on uh, different ideas on, on, these, on these topics. So in addition to these, uh, and I've heard uh, um, a couple of things in the last few days, so we also have a resource on law enforcement role in victim compensation, uh, enhanced law enforcement response to children exposed to violence and childhood trauma, and another one on identifying and responding to elder abuse. And there's several more on the page. Again, not enough time to, to list everything that is on there. This is what the, uh, the page looks like when you, uh, go back one, there we go. When, uh, when we hit that website, uh, and then uh, from there, there are links to take you to a lot of different places. A couple of resources that we have for you today are these two. So Enhancing Law Enforcement Response to Victims Overview, and then the Frequently Asked Questions. These two documents have been printed by our host. Thank you for that. They're on the back table. Uh, it is uh, a number of them. If we run out, um, please let me know. We can either get more or we can point you again to this website that has all of that information. So. You all know why this is important, uh, and we're trying to help law enforcement agencies understand why this is important. Uh, in the U.S., many victim-based uh, uh, or U.S.-based victim advocate programs are part of prosecutors' offices um, at the local levels, and, and that's, that's good to some extent. Uh, but we're trying to also uh, increase the focus to embed victim advocates and law enforcement agencies to provide these more holistic services. Large agencies sometimes have those. Federal agencies, like our partners in the FBI, they have that. But a lot of smaller agencies do not. So where the difference lies is that 
for a prosecutor's office to get involved in, uh, in a victim-centered case, there has to be a charge. There has to be an arrest. That's how it gets to the prosecutor. Well, in many cases, there isn't. Or in the cycle of violence, if we can intervene earlier, before there's an arrest, maybe uh, you know, when there's, um, uh, if there's, there's you know, a verbal altercation rather than when it gets to a physical altercation. The police will know about that, but maybe there's not enough to make a charge. So when the victim advocate is law enforcement agency based, they can intervene earlier uh, and they can hopefully break that cycle of violence or serve that victim in a way and connect them to, to some of these partnerships. Now, I don't have time to go in these examples. Maybe we will during the panel, but let me, uh, let me jump to a couple other quick things and then I'll wrap up. So this was released yesterday, came out to our members and our daily listserv we call the lead. Uh, and it's a law enforcement based victim services uh, agency incorporation of services. So a lot of what I've been talking about in incorporating the victim service function within a law enforcement agency. And, and it, it talks about the benefits to victims first because that's what's most important, right? Benefits to the agency and then of course benefits to our community. Again, all this is on the website uh, from there. So uh, in, in uh, wrapping up, if you are a member of the IACP, thank you for your membership. Uh, you are part of our 33,000 people in 170 countries that gives us the advocacy weight to make a difference and help us shape the future of the policing profession. Um, if you're not, we have room. Uh, we would love to have you as a member. Uh, we, we find we enhance um, the, the, the offerings we have for our law enforcement leaders when we bring in professionals and support folks from other sectors and certainly in the victim field. And as I mentioned, uh, we have some openings on our victim services committee. So if you are interested, here's the website or you can talk to me. My colleague, uh, John Perrin is here with me as well. One of our staff members in our global policing division. Happy to talk to you about that as well. Uh, thank you uh, for being here. Thank you for your attention. But more importantly, thank you for what you do. It is critically important. Um, and I know as a, as a law enforcement officer now for over 40 years, I really appreciate the victim services professionals I've had the opportunity to work with. Uh, it makes a huge difference uh, in our agency, in our community, and how we serve uh, those people who are most vulnerable. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, before I carry on, just uh, so you know, uh, one of the hotel cards has been found in, in the men's toilet, so if you've lost it, uh, we have it. It'll be at the back over there. John, thank you so much for that. I, th I think that, there, well, there's so many things to go through together, but um, some of those points around compassion, empathy, belief, all the points that Ben made as well around accountability, th these are extremely important. We uh, published, yet again, another plug for another one of our papers. We, we produced a paper on uh, National Victim Support Framework, which really talks about the fact that support is everyone's job. Uh, and a really important aspect of that is how you incorporate specialist uh, victim knowledge within the police. We know that we have EU legislation. We know that that's um, implemented in, in variable ways of, of across Europe. In particular, the way that victims are treated by the police makes a difference. So it's essential that we, we have these efforts, we have this collaboration for the police to change. But it's also, as you said at the end there, John, it's essential that the police recognize the role of victim support services in providing support, in collaborating together, but also in developing the training and, and assisting the police in developing their knowledge. So thank you for that, John. So uh, our last speaker for this morning uh, is, is someone I've had a great pleasure talking to and I could, could uh, speak for many hours. Uh, we, uh, when I first spoke to her, I was and she started explaining all the work that they're doing and the adaptations they're making in the FBI Victim Services. I said, you have to speak at our conference. So I'm very happy to introduce now Stacey Beers. Uh, she is the um, she's in the victim she's the Victim Services Coordinator within the FBI Victim Services Division, uh, and she has been working as, as really as a beacon of support and advocacy for victims of crime. So she'll be talking today about some of the work that the Victim Services Div Division does in the FBI. Thank you, Stacey.
everyone. It's nice to see everyone, and it's great to be in a great room of people who are really dedicated to making a difference in the victims of difference in victims' lives. So thank you for this opportunity. I'm very excited to share some of the initiatives that we are doing within the FBI and trying to make uh, the lives of victims a little bit better. Uh, so the one thing I wanted to start out, and we think about talking about victim orient and, and orientation in, in policing is, one thing I think it's important to remember is victims are volunteers. We do not have to implore them to speak with us. They, victims do not have to raise their hand and come and speak with us. And we know that because we know different victims that come and speak to us or uh, receive services may not want to speak to the police. And so when we think about um, how we can make a difference and some of the initiatives that we can kind of lead um, and try to meet victims where they are, I'm going to highlight three of them that we're working on in the FBI. The one thing I do want to share is that I know that we talked this morning about uh, trauma-informed, you know, all those kind of words that we use, victim-centered, but I want to highlight it by sharing a little bit of information about that before we talk about um, some of these initiatives. So one of the things that I have always been passionate about is planning and preparing. Um, law enforcement is generally reactive, right? And we want them to be. We want law enforcement to be reactive. We want them to go out and fix the problem, solve the crime. Um, but it, those of us in victim services, I think, need to be at the table when we talk about planning and preparing, and we need to talk about what that looks like. When we think about that trauma-informed approach, I'm just going to kind of highlight a couple of uh, the principles that we see in trauma-informed approach, and then I'm going to apply them to the, the three initiatives that I'm very excited to talk about. One of the, the first um, key principles is obviously safety, and we need to think about what makes victims feel safe. What makes me feel safe may not make you feel safe. And thinking about what that means for victims, so asking them uh, and thinking about um, how we can make it safer for them. Um, trustworthiness and transparency. You know, law enforcement has an investigation to run. They're always focused about trying to figure out um, what is happening next. Um, and they may not be able to share that information with victims. But talking about the process, instead of saying, no, we can't help you, we can't talk to you because it's an open investigation, maybe saying things to them like, I know that you want to know all this information. I would want to know that too. Perhaps jot it down. And when we get to that point in the investigation, we can have that conversation. That makes them feel part of the process and not dismissed. And so I think having those conversations is really important. Collaboration and mutuality. We need victims for our investigations. They have information that we don't have. And so it actually having them sit with us instead of being uh, this case versus that person and having that adversarial kind of conversation or role, I think can be really, really important. Empowerment, voice, and choice. How can we empower victims to want to speak with us? Um, what do we make, how, how do we make them want to be part of the process? And talking about the initiatives, the studies that we heard about this morning in the UK, um, IACP's initiatives, all of those kind of start with law enforcement, but they also start in the community, which is another key principle. When we think about cultural, historical, and, and that gender uniqueness, we need to know the communities that we serve. Um, and a lot of times we don't think about that because we're just kind of running in there. So when we respond to communities, I want to know what are the languages that are spoken? How many children are in that community? You know, what are the demographics that make up that community so that we can kind of mirror that community? And so saying all those things, um, part of that goes into the planning and preparedness when we think about how we are going to respond to communities. Um, next slide, please. So the first initiative I'd like to share with you is something that I'm really excited about. Um, the FBI launched this initiative in 2015, and uh, what it basically is is death notification, how we provide death notifications to victims in cases. In the United States, a lot of law enforcement agencies do not have training on how to do death notifications, and that's not anything that's abnormal. It's just that it's just not something that's taught. Um, we don't teach it in the FBI, at least we hadn't before 2015. Um, a lot of law enforcement agencies, local law enforcement agencies, don't teach it in their academies. And so after quite a few mass violence incidents, what we found is that um, when we were doing after actions with those communities, victims were telling us um, that the one thing that really um, started off on the wrong foot was how they were notified of, that, of their loved one's death. 
And so what we did was we looked at a four-step model. We didn't create this model. I think sometimes um, we forget maybe that what has already been in existence. And so we looked at a model that's already been tried and true. And so in the United States, Mothers Against Drunk Driving created a model. It's probably about 25, 30 years old. Um, we use it in victim services for many years. Concerns of police survivors use it as a model to do line of death uh, notifications. And so what we were able to do is we were able to put it online, and so it's free, it's available for people to take. Uh, we really developed it for law enforcement um, to come off the road for maybe about an hour to take this, this training. Um, as you go through this, the, the model, there is a, a quiz at the end, so a lot of our agencies are certified, uh, law enforcement agencies are certified, and so um, you were able to do a quiz at the end and they're able to get uh, a certificate for completion. So what I will tell you is that the four-step model is pretty basic, and I'm going to go into a lot of details this afternoon during the workshop that I'm very excited to present about this. Um, but it's planning, preparedness, delivery, and follow-up. Pretty basic four steps. But we really get into the nuances of what we need to do in order to make this a successful notification. To date, we have had about 40,000 individuals take this training and gotten a lot of feedback about this. So I'm happy to share with you that um, right now a university hosts our, um, our training and the website is right here at the bottom so you're welcome to access it from your cell phones, wherever. Um, next slide, please. But I'm really excited to tell you about what's coming. And so um, what we've learned over the past few years of doing this is that we need to enhance this training. We're missing a couple things. Victims have taught us more things about this and so um, we're going to be enhancing this online platform. First of all, it's going to be coming into um, the FBI system, so it will be launched on FBI.gov, which is great because that has a very large platform. A lot of people do access our website. It's going to um, have updated materials, so things related to um, demographics and why you should know your community. Um, other things related to um, how to actually do it. So in the, in the um, initial uh, training videos, there is one video demonstration. But what we have found is when we are doing this, one size does not fit all. And so we have created four different uh, videos sh showing how it goes when it doesn't go so well and then how to correct it. And so we've used a couple different scenarios. All of these scenarios have a different cultural nuance. So whether it's working with the LGBT community, um, our Native American population, um, individuals that may have substance abuse issues. We think about how we sometimes are in situations where we have to do a notification. We have to think about some of these situations that um, we find ourselves in to be able to do this. And so those videos uh, will be um, updated into the, the new um, website. The other thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be, re um, we're going to be releasing an app, and that app is going to be available um, so that we have law enforcement or even victim services agencies that are going out to do the notification and you need a quick review. The four steps will be on here, um, the language will be on here, resources will be on here. Part of the, uh, the original website, we have a coping with grief brochure. It's been translated into 10 different languages. And so if we're going out to a home where somebody may be Spanish speaking um, and we don't have materials in Spanish, we can now use the app and we'll be able to push that Spanish brochure to that person either via text or email. So we're kind of excited about that. Um, it also has lookup features. So in the United States, if something happens in one state and we need to find a referral in another state, we'll be able to have that quick lookup feature. And so the goal is to really have it in a one-stop shop. So that's going to be released as well um, when, as we move forward. The one thing, too, that we are finding is that when we launched this training, uh, a lot of law enforcement agencies were asking us, can you come out and train this? We don't really have uh, the depth on the bench to do that. Um, and so what, we've gonna, what we're going to be doing is we are going to be uh, developing a facilitator's guide so that we will have an educational component. So if people want to train their own law enforcement agencies or victim services want to train community partners, you will actually have the slide deck, the facilitator's guide, and all that information there. So that's something we're, we're very excited about. So that's going to be the relaunch of this, um, of this actual training. The other thing is you will notice how we've changed the name. We are now going to be branding this as trauma notification. 
When we are working with victims, we are just not informing them of death. Think about if you're a victim advocate or law enforcement and you are notifying a person that their child's um, images have been exploited online. Or think about uh, when you maybe be working with somebody and you're telling them that their life savings has been stolen from a romance scam or things like that. People are in trauma. So we can use this four-step model to actually notify victims of all types of crimes. And so what we are doing in the Bureau is rebranding this death notification training to trauma notification. And those four steps will be able to be applied to all of that. What we have also found in the FBI is that when we have mass violence incidents, local law enforcement is often investigating these cases and they're focused on the investigation. But when they come to the FBI and they're asking for a variety of services, sometimes we get asked to do notifications. And as I said, we don't teach this in the FBI. Uh, it's not something that our agents are taught. But what we did was, we re uh, three years ago, we launched what we call trauma notification teams in the FBI. And so what that is, it's a group of law enforcement partners, um, FBI agents, and our victim specialists that make up trauma notifications. We have 56 FBI offices throughout the United States, and as of last week, we have 22 that actually have teams. And what that allows us to do is, if there is a mass violence incident, and the local community is responding to the investigation, it will allow us to pull a team and actually have people who are already trained to go out and do these notifications so we're set up for success. So we're kind of excited about that. We're excited to see where that's going, but that's something that we're really happy about. So that's the first initiative that I wanted to talk about this morning. And there's more to follow this afternoon if anybody's interested in the workshop that I'm really lucky to be able to present. Next slide, please. This is the second initiative that we thought about. When you think about planning and preparedness, and we think about working with external partners, you know, we're trying to figure out how can we best interface with other partners who have legal requirements in the United States to support victims. One of the things in the United States in the federal system in which I work is victims of crime have federal rights and they're just not on paper. In the federal system, if we don't provide victims their rights, they can sue and, um, and they, they can and they should be able to sue us because they haven't gotten those rights. And so it's just not the right thing to do in the United States, it's a legal thing to do. And so um, what I will tell you is, in the United States, uh, the cruise line, the high-speed rail, which is Amtrak, I know in Europe you have a lot of high-speed rail, um, we just have one, <laughs> um, and also our airlines, they all have legislative requirements. And so the question that when we were having these conversations is, well, what happens if something happens on one of our, let's just say, modes of transportation, where do your legal requirements come into play and where do our legal requirements come into play? So we've had a number of different um, conversations, next slide please, um, related to this initiative. We actually met with Amtrak, uh, and we've had a series of conversations with them. Uh, these really are phased engaging, engagements. Um, we try to figure out like where are those areas of intersectionality is and then where can we come up with different um, guidance. And so last year, and actually this year in February, we launched our rail liaison guidance so that our rail liaison agents as well as our victim specialists are aware of that. Um, next week we're actually doing our uh, workshop with the domestic airlines, so we'll be pushing something out about that, and the cruise lines. And I will tell you that um, except for the rail, the cruise lines and the airlines, they actually have international annexes for us. So we're talking to some of our international carriers as well about that, and they're very excited to be part of this conversation. Next slide, please. So this is what I'm very excited about. This should put a smile on everybody's face. Um, so this is our crisis response canines. I understand that Victim Support Europe has FIDO. Um, we have crisis response canines, and we have Wally and Geo. Um, I am very partial because I am the handler for Wally, and so um, I miss him terribly. When I do presentations, he's usually snoring at my feet. I bore him tremendously. Um, but we're really excited because, uh, next slide please. Um, this initiative was started in 2015. It's actually based off the Canadian model, um, and we were able to acquire two crisis response canines. Really does uh, focus on the canine human bond, and we really, um, focus on mitigating stress and anxiety for victims. As, uh, like Fido, our dogs are facility dogs. 
Um, there's a whole, pro I could do a two hour presentation on this topic, uh, but I will tell you that it's our position that we use facility dogs with crime victims for a variety of reasons. Um, but I will say that, you know, when the FBI comes knocking, not many people are raising their hands to wanna talk, right? <laughs> but you bring a dog into a room, it's over. And so when we think about going out to work with children who might be very afraid to speak to grown-ups, let alone, you know, people in suits, um, to sit on the floor and have a conversation or to have an interview with a child. Um, after a large um, active shooter initiative uh, where people have heard, seen, experienced such trauma, when they walk in a large room and they're met with one of our victim specialists, who we've got three here today uh, with us, you know, to have them sit with Wally or Geo as they receive services, it is so meaningful. And the work that they do is incredible. Um, they are really huge at building rapport. And so when you think about access and you think about rapport, you know, that is what we see a lot of. Um, I could sit here and tell you countless stories uh, with victims, and the honor that I have being on the other end of the leash with Wally has been a game changer. This is my 32nd year in victim services, and since partnered with Wally, he is a tool that I never knew that I needed. Um, uh, but I will tell you that uh, he has changed the face of as we work with victims. And so whether we're working in a hospital with victims, um, in an you know, intensive care unit where somebody is not verbal, but they can lift their hand and they can pet his head and they can have a conversation with the agent, it makes all the difference in the world. And so I'm very, very excited about uh, the work that we're doing. We received funding to get more canines, which we're very excited about. Wally is now nine and Gia will be 10 this year, so it's time for them to, to kind of go out uh, and retire probably next year. Uh, but we're able to get more dogs and we're gonna be putting them in the field uh, with, uh, with some folks, so that'll be really, really helpful. Um, the one thing that I will tell you that we're working on because people come to us because in the, in the FBI, well, I should say in the United States, we are the first federal agency that has housed facility dogs, which is pretty significant. So we're kind of pioneering this. Because we're pioneering it, people come to us and say, tell us how you did it. What are some things that you've learned? And what are some things that we shouldn't do? So we actually created um, best practice guidelines that uh, we had two working groups uh, with a lot of the different experts in the United States as well as Canada about how they had their programs and different things. So we are actually in the phase of reviewing these best practice guidelines and we hope that they're going to be released um, hopefully within the next year and they'll be available to all, all partners as well. Uh, next slide please. I know I talked about a lot. I also know that I talk very fast so I apologize especially to the interpreters. Um, and uh, if you have any other questions, you're welcome to reach out. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. So I think you can understand now why I could talk for hours with Stacey. Well, I wouldn't do the talking, obviously Stacey would do the talking. Thank you so much, Stacey. I think there's there's so many things uh, really that you covered through that. I won't go through all of them, but but uh, just to say, when Chat uh, GPT first came out, the first prompt I did was a deaf notification. It did a very good job. Um, I wonder if it used some of the materials that, that you already had out there. So we've covered a huge amount of things there. Just to say, the, the, the ICP website, FBI website, but also the OVC website, they have huge amounts of material. Of course, it's US focused generally, um, but we as VSC have, have really benefited from being able to access that. We launched our uh, training academy last year. We've really benefited from that and adapted it to the European uh, context as well. Go and have a look at those websites. You're really going to benefit. Most of the stuff out there is free as well. Uh, you also talked about partnership with private industry. This is something we're seeing more and more. We were at a leadership in counterterrorism conference last week. There's a lot of private industry that is uh, looking to engage with victim services, improve the, the way they operate. In the UK now, they're introducing a new law to ensure that the uh, private sector is properly securing uh, their, their services, but also able to provide uh, victims with help as well. And yes, facility dogs, another Another plug for facility dogs. We have Facility Dogs Europe. It's a, it's a European network. We worked with, with partners in, in France, in Italy, in Belgium, uh, and in Ireland to set up uh, and to train facility dogs. 
this is just something that we're really starting um, and, and the partners, are in, especially in France, are really pushing this forward. We would like to see them uh, across the whole of Europe. I think, Stacey, that was a great plug for them. Uh, let's see if we can do more. So with that, I will now hand over to Marina, who's going to do a quick icebreaker for us. Over to you, Marina. Good morning. I'm here only just for a few questions to figure out what you've taken out so far from those three beautiful presentations. I'm inviting you to open the Slido app. Describe in one word what your experience. What is the thing you value most in a police officer? First question. Respect, trust, empathy, plans, kindness, fairness, calmness, dedication, professionalism, safety, beauty. <laughs> 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 Attitude, dog, anti-racism, service, reliability, intelligence, that's a good one also, solve crime, care, attitude, listen, good listener, assistance, authenticity, 3273263. Reliability, understanding of homophobia, calmness, clarity, commitment to justice, improvement, LGBT plus friendly. Okay, empathy is the leading word and uh, I will, I think, close this question for now. Thank you. The next question. Give us one word that comes to your mind related to Ben's presentation. Yes, you are, you are leading it. Let's start with a good one. Awesome, smart, rights, justice, chief, professional, awesome, listening, persuasive, relational, hope, data. Who is Ben? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Researched earrings. Oh, engaging, statistic, useful, rational, nice slides, intelligence, relevant, fair, trust, common sense, creative. Ben, I think that's enough already. Yes, compliments. <laughs> Thank you. The next question. One word that comes to mind related to John's presentation. Powerful, progressive, trust, cool, community winning, great, leadership, awesome, chiefs, inspiring, dedicated, winning, American, professionalism, <laughs> global, community, tall, <laughs> very American, work together, <laughs> policing not as a force, <laughs> Victim-centered, cooperation, trust, community, inspiring, work together again, motivation, unexpected. And I think on this one, we are also proceeding to the last question. One word about Stacey's presentation. Dog, <laughs> Wally, yeah! Inspiring, powerful, bubbly. Strong personality, hope, trauma-informed, super caring, rock star, authentic, sympathetic, brilliant, I want a dog, <laughs> Geo lively, positive, rock star again, wanted to pet a dog, uh, I miss my working dog, <laughs> facility dogs, Fido Europe, female, I'm finishing over here, thank you very much.
we are embarking now on the uh, coffee break. We've got 30 minutes. And I'm inviting kindly all of you to use our brand wall to make at least one picture of yourself to increase the exposure of this event so that we gain next year at least 7,000 more attendees. <laughs> the brand wall is there. Thank you very much. Okay? Yes. <laughs> Dear colleagues, I uh, I like to go on. Are you ready and prepared for the for the next session? Um, we have uh, we are the topic of uh, of this panel discussion is putting victims at the heart of policing. That's the topic. And we have three guests sitting here on, uh, on the stage. Um, I think, uh, John, you have already met uh, this, uh, this morning, so I don't have to, to introduce him uh, again. Next to him is, uh, is Jong Jochem Kompelke. And uh, he is a senior police officer and the federal chairman of the, the police union in, uh, in Germany. And next to me is um, Elena Sanchez. And Elena Sanchez is a member of, of co-chair of the executive uh, of board of the LCBTE poll organization. And um, uh, because it's a panel discussion, uh, we have asked our dear members in the panel uh, to maybe say s some things more about their daily work and then also introduce a case they deal with every day and try to concentrate about policing and safety of, um, of victims and how we can improve. But they have an, an sort of an open role. And uh, our intention is to finish this panel, uh, look to you, and maybe you will have some, uh, some pending questions and we give room for that. And if you want it in English or in, uh, in German, it's both possible, uh, we try to translate it. Is that clear? Yes? Okay. Um, Elena, then first I give the floor to you, maybe to introduce a little bit your work and, uh, and a case. Hi, thank you very much, all of you, for being here and uh, the organization, of course. Um, I will tell you a little bit about my uh, daily work. Um, I have two jobs as a police officer, one paid and one and unpaid. <laughs> Uh, the one paid is in the International Cooperation Division in Spain. This is uh, maybe you will understand better Interpol, Siren, Europol. Uh, I am in the SPOC. This is the single point of contact where we receive all the information, analyze it and uh, work on it. Okay, but this is not uh, the reason I am here. The reason I am here is my voluntary work which is in the police association, LGBTI poll, uh, composed by, by the uh, whole diversity of police uh, law enforcement in all over Spain. We have different law enforcement uh, with different tasks, with different uh, also way of working. And uh, that's why uh, we decided to build an association out 
from just one police uh, service. Uh, not, it's not a police union, it's outside one of these uh, police uh, corps. And uh, we include all the other police corps so that we can uh, reach the whole national territory, the whole uh, way of uh, managing diversity. And uh, we are uh, very sensitive, especially with the LGBTIQ plus community. Uh, this is a very attack vulnerable uh, group. Um, and most of the police officers in the association uh, belong to this community, but not necessary. Just the, the question is to be upstander, you know, to have an upstander uh, attitude, to have an upstander position, not, uh, not being a bystander anymore. We, we step forward and we go and say, okay, there are some things we have to improve. There are also lack of some other uh, questions. We have to uh, be more inclusive. We, be, we have to be more uh, professional in, in the management of diversity. This community is very vulnerable. It's very attacked all over uh, Europe and all also in Spain. We have very good regulations, but uh, the thing is that uh, when it comes to um, decide whether it is a, a, a hate crime or not, hmm, something's going on. And this is why we are here and trying to improve all of this and cover all the you know, empty spaces. And uh, also, uh, another thing we have to do a lot, and we need, uh, it is really needed to be done, um, is to build a bridge to the community from, from the part of the law enforcement. Um, confidence is very easy to, to lose, and very, very, very hard to recover. And there are a lot of uh, things that are happening nowadays and uh, happened already in the past. And, and these things uh, separate law enforcement from the community, from the society. We have to protect the society. And this is why uh, police is so important in these questions. Um, I will tell you about the case, a real case uh, that happened uh, uh, recently, more or less, um, right after the uh, pandemic period, uh, uh, when everything started to work again, uh, people can, uh, could go out uh, again in the nights and the, and the pubs, etc. Uh, there was a boy, a 24 years old boy, that was very excited uh, at, the, at this prospect of being allowed uh, going out for the night again, um, because uh, beca because of the confinement uh, it was not possible for a long time, and then he was accompanied by some friends, and they were in the club. They went out, uh, two of them, he and another girl went out uh, for a video call, trying to cheer to, to um, that a friend joined them next uh, night. And they were, the, uh, they were uh, recording around, uh, saying, hey, see how many people already on the street? Uh, let's, uh, let's have fun, we are having fun, it's very nice. Come and join us. Uh, walking. By them, uh, in the very near them uh, was a couple, a boy and a, and a girl, more or less of the same age, and uh, they started to um, shout at him. The mobile phone was in his hands, not in his hands, okay, but they started to shout at him. Uh, because uh, they were uh, not allowing uh, to be uh, recorded, to, to appear on this video call. They didn't know it was a video call. 
but they decided it, it was, uh, they were filming them. Uh, and they uh, started to be very uh, violent and aggressive against him. What happened next? The next thing is that uh, he was punched by him. Um, the, the girl accompanying the boy uh, tried to stop it and the other girl uh, put her away. So uh, it was totally chaotic and then uh, somebody on the street helped them and, and separate them in order to help uh, and prevent it was uh, going to anything worse. So the, the, what happened next? Um, this couple came back again mm. to the scenario and uh, brought 12 more people with them. So imagine the next. Uh, Samuel Luis is his name. He was beaten uh, until death. So um, yeah, there uh, a lot of things happened there. Uh, the shouting. Um, he said exactly. Either you stop recording or I kill you, faggot. And all the time the shouting was uh, fucking faggot. <laughs> Uh, with this uh, crowd against one only person. Um, th there were witnesses that can confirm this motivation with directly to the, to the police. And also security cameras were, there was all, all of it, what happened was recorded. Um, the clear perception of all of the people that was witnessing uh, on the scenario. Um, also, it was very easy to provide the uh, identities of these people because uh, um, because of the pandemic at the beginning, uh, um, all the names and the uh, identification numbers uh, from the IDs, pa uh, passports, etc., were taken. So it was uh, very easy also to to identify, but what happened uh, that uh, was really a very high impact all over Spain, all over the national territory, is that uh, at the beginning, initially, it was not taken, uh, it was not taken as it was a serious hate crime. Uh, even there was a police officer that spoke to the newspaper and to the media and uh, denying this uh, mm, motivation or adapting, saying, well, let's see if it is or not, when it, it was really clear that it wa what, what it was. So um, what happened next? <laughs> um, imagine all the LGBT community all over Spain, uh, all uh, in every city were demonstrating. Uh, they were also um, um, saying not beautiful things about the police because they were uh, losing distrust because of, of this, you know, it was very, very serious. So that's why, um, um, thanks in part to the to the pressure exerted by a letter that this association <laughs> wrote to the secretary of the state, we wrote directly a, a letter explaining all the situation, trying to uh, make an aware rising um, and explaining all the indicators about these crimes. Uh, which couldn't be dismissed, and uh, the also we um, wrote an email to the commissioner of the national police in, in charge in La Coruña, where it happened. La Coruña is uh, a city from the northwest of Spain, and uh, finally it, it was you know considered with this uh, application of the aggravating circumstance contained in the penal code. Um, but uh, what could be better done 
what could be better for the, for the next uh, time it happens something like this. Um, from the beginning, the perception of the victims who are not the the who is not the one who is dead, obviously, because the victims uh, when a boy is dead are all the families, all the you know all the community, all the the, the imagine the um, impact. So um, in this moment you realize how big it is, uh, how big is the damage done. Now we have to work harder on recovering the police uh, trust, trust building. We, we need to do a very hard work on trust building and the uh, um, indicators were very clear. Perception of all the witnesses the perception of the perpetrators, because mm, he was chosen not because this video call was an only an excuse, of course, to approach him. And uh, you cannot say this is uh, enough uh, to create such a situation. Also, a Pride Week was you know, the, 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 this happened during the uh, Pride Week. Although it was not um, LGBT club, but all happened in the Pride, during this Pride Week, and uh, we were celebrating advances. So something was going on very positively for the LGBTQI plus community. And it was not taken at the at initially at into account. What happened if police does not take it? But from the beginning, from for the victims, uh, it's very important uh, to listen to their perception and never dismiss this from the beginning. So, okay, we will. I will uh, let my colleagues keep on going, and then later we will. Uh, come back again to this. So that now you can think a, a little bit about it. Thank you for, uh, thank you for uh, sharing this, uh, this case. I, I think especially for the um, LHBTI plus cl um, um, community, it's already very difficult, but I still think being a victim is always difficult, isn't it? So we should do a lot about um, accepting, I think, uh, being victim as, as a whole, and especially for, uh, for this group too. Uh, a lot of learning has to be done uh, everywhere in society. Uh, but let's, let's listen to Jochen. Jochen, you, you're speaking in, uh, in German, but um, that's for some of you um, just to put in your, your ears. Yes? Okay, please. Schönen guten Tag und vielen Dank für die Möglichkeit, bei einer solch tollen Veranstaltung mit so wichtigem und herausforderndem Thema sprechen zu dürfen. Bevor man als Polizist wie ich oder als offizieller Bundesvorsitzender einer Gewerkschaft eine Perspektive von Opfern einnehmen kann, würde ich gerne hier einmal, insbesondere weil es europäisch ist, die deutsche föderale Struktur darstellen wollen, weil das zum einen die Chance bietet zu verstehen, wie gut es tut, wenn mal eine andere Perspektive eingenommen wird und zum anderen kann man verstehen, welche Herausforderungen Deutschland und die Sicherheitsbehörden in Deutschland haben, um besser in der Polizeiarbeit zu werden. Die Bundesrepublik Deutschland hat 18 Polizeibehörden. 16 Bundesländer haben ihre eigenen Polizeien. Das mag für jemanden aus den USA klein wirken, das ist für die Bundesrepublik aber eine große Herausforderung. Und zu den 16 Landespolizeibehörden kommen drei Bundesbehörden, das Bundeskriminalamt, die Bundespolizei und für den Bundestag eine eigene Polizei. 
all diese 18 Behörden haben denselben Auftrag. Gefahren abwehren, also präventiv Dinge tun, damit gar keine Kriminalität entsteht und Straftaten zu verfolgen. Und die Gesetzesgrundlagen sind sehr unterschiedlich. Der Deutsche Bundestag hat mit dem Strafgesetzbuch, mit der Strafprozessordnung und anderen Gesetzen und Anweisungen den Rahmen gesetzt für Kriminalitätsbekämpfung in Deutschland. Und die einzelnen Bundesländer tun das ebenfalls in ihren jeweiligen Polizeigesetzen. Was deutsche Polizeibehörden nicht tun, anders als in zum Beispiel angloamerikanischen Polizeien, ist darüber hinaus noch weitere Aufträge zu haben, wie zum Beispiel sich um das Wohlbefinden von Menschen zu kümmern oder darüber hinaus in Teilen sozialarbeiterische Fähigkeiten abzuliefern. Das heißt, deutsche Polizeibehörden haben einen sehr reglementierten Auftrag. Das zwingt uns Polizistinnen und Polizisten in ein sehr enges Korsett. Und wenn man die Perspektive von Opfern annehmen möchte, dann muss man seine eigene Rolle erst einmal verstehen. Und dafür ist es wichtig zu verstehen, wer heutzutage in Deutschland Polizistin oder Polizist wird. In der Regel junge Menschen zwischen 20 und 25, je nach Schulabschluss, die ganz klassische Ausbildung machen, mittlerweile überwiegend an einer Hochschule. Sie lernen also wissenschaftlich, gepaart mit Praxisanteilen, wie Polizeiarbeit funktioniert und bekommen erste Impulse aus Sicht eines Opfers, aus Sicht im Strafverfahren von Anwältinnen und Anwälten, wie Polizeiarbeit funktioniert und erfahren dann auch im Weiteren, wie die deutsche Justiz funktioniert, mit Strafverfahren und Möglichkeiten der Prozessführung. Aber der geringste Anteil in Ausbildungsinhalten ist die Perspektive von Opfern. Deshalb ist es hocherfreulich, dass wenn man die Bundesrepublik verlässt und das europäische Feld sieht, dass Europa, die EU, sich diesem Thema annimmt und unter anderem über die entsprechenden Opferschutz Gesetzgebung und Statuten ermöglicht, dass deutsche Behörden ein Stück weit gezwungen werden, Dinge zu implementieren, Perspektiven zu implementieren, die im Weiteren auch viel Einfluss auf den Polizeialltag nehmen. Das bedeutet, im Zusammenspiel mit der EU sind wir sehr dankbar, dass erste Polizeihochschulen in der Ausbildung bestimmte Sichtweisen übernehmen, wissenschaftliche, evidenzbasierte Mechanismen damit die Polizeiarbeit perspektivisch immer besser wird. Warum muss Polizeiarbeit besonders gut sein? Das Vertrauen der deutschen Polizeibehörden oder das Vertrauen in deutsche Polizeibehörden ist sehr hoch in Deutschland. Der Beruf Polizistin und Polizist ist ein sehr geschätzter in der Bundesrepublik. Das hat aber überwiegend damit zu tun, dass auch der überwiegende Teil aller polizeilichen Vorgänge aus der Bevölkerung angezeigt werden. Ganz klassisch, eine Nachbarin, ein Nachbar bekommt etwas mit, Dritte und rufen die Polizei. Viel weniger sind Opfer selbst, die den Weg zu Polizeibehörden oder der Staatsanwaltschaft finden und in einer noch kleineren Anzahl wird die Polizei selbstständig auf Kriminalität oder Sachverhalte aufmerksam. Und wenn wir jetzt die Rolle der Opfer annehmen wollen und wissen, dass Opfer durchaus starke, Schultern starke Partnerinnen und Partner an der Seite haben, nämlich Unbeteiligte, die sagen, hier braucht man die Polizei, dann muss jede einzelne Polizeibehörde erst einmal die Fähigkeit besitzen, eine Opferrolle einnehmen zu können, ohne in eine Opferrolle zu fallen, die dazu führt, dass man sich verschließt vor Problemen innerbetrieblicher Art. Also sprechen wir natürlich darüber, wie finden Communities, wie finden Menschen überhaupt Zugang zur Polizei zu Polizeibehörden. Das heißt, wir haben in Deutschland mittlerweile zu Recht eine Debatte darüber, ob ich als Mensch an einer Polizeidienststelle erscheinen muss, um etwas anzuzeigen, oder ob ich im Internet digital den Weg zur Polizei suchen kann. Und Ihnen im Raum brauche ich das nicht sagen. Der Weg übers Internet ist meist schneller und einfacher, weil man erste Hürden, möglicherweise des Schamgefühls, der Sorge, wie das Verfahren läuft oder andere, gar nicht erst entstehen lässt. Also 
muss man diesen 18 Polizeibehörden natürlich ermöglichen, digital Anzeigemöglichkeiten zu haben. Die Realität ist, dass das in diesen vielen Behörden überhaupt nicht der Alltag ist. Und das ist ein erschreckendes erstes Beispiel dafür, dass ein modernes Land wie die Bundesrepublik Deutschland nicht in allen Bereichen so fortschrittlich ist. Deshalb gucken wir gerne in diesem Sicherheitsnetzwerk zu europäischen anderen Ländern, wie wird es dort gemacht, und versuchen im Best-Practice-Verfahren auch in der Bundesrepublik voneinander zu partizipieren. Und wenn Polizistinnen und Polizisten gut ausgebildet sind, technisch gut ausgestattet sind und der Dienstalltag das zulässt, dass sie sich fortbilden und ausbilden, dann können Mechanismen, wie hier wahrscheinlich die letzten Tage durchaus offen kommuniziert, greifen, nämlich Community Policing, bürgernahe Polizeiarbeit. Die deutschen Polizeien sind nicht militärisch geprägt. Der eigentliche Ansatz aller föderalen Bundesländer ist zu sagen, wir wollen eine Polizei in der Mitte der Gesellschaft, wir wollen Polizistinnen und Polizisten, die das Gespräch mit jedem Mensch in der Bundesrepublik suchen können, um dadurch einmal Vertrauen zu gewinnen und auf der anderen Seite dem gesetzlichen Auftrag zu folgen. Das erleben wir zunehmend, ist nicht in allen Communities der Fall. Wir erleben durch öffentliche Debatten, wir erleben durch Änderung unserer statistischen Erhebungen durchaus, dass wir bei bestimmten Communities, also auch bei bestimmten Opfern, keine Akzeptanz haben. Das ist insofern problematisch, als dass es natürlich andere Wege gibt, Dinge anzuzeigen, aber Polizeien müssen damit umgehen und sich verändern und verbessern. Das heißt, es gibt in dieser föderalen Struktur eine Vielzahl an ersten Möglichkeiten, Verbesserungen, um überhaupt wieder Bürgernähe, Community Policing vorantreiben zu können. Dafür haben wir spezielle AnsprechpartnerInnen, um Kontakt herstellen zu können, Vertrauen aufzubauen. Es werden erste polizeiliche Konzepte angepasst, um überhaupt erst einmal im Prozess Strafverfolgung auch den richtigen Blick für Opfer zu haben. All das wird gepaart natürlich das ist wahrscheinlich nicht nur ein deutsches äh, Vorgehen, mit viel Statistik, mit viel Erhebung, mit wenig Wissenschaft, aber viel Bürokratie. Und deshalb ist es natürlich für uns als Gewerkschaft wichtig, einen Arbeitsalltag in die Entscheidungsebenen der Bundespolitik von gewählten Abgeordneten, aber auch äh, in die laufenden Prozesse von Polizeibehörden Einfluss zu nehmen und einzubringen. Und ich würde Zwei Dinge gerne besonders herausgreifen. Das eine ist natürlich die Frage, wie man in Communities mittlerweile Community Policing betreiben kann. Polizeien müssen verstehen, dass sie die Community fragen, was ihre Bedürfnisse sind, um auf die Bedürfnisse reagieren zu können. Das heißt, es braucht auch eine bestimmte Fähigkeit und Ressourcen, Bedürfnissen nachkommen zu können. Zum Beispiel, wie wünscht man sich AnsprechpartnerInnen? Sollen das junge Menschen sein? Sollen das diverse Menschen sein? Soll das das klassische Bild eines Polizisten sein, der durch den Stadtteil geht? All das muss hinterfragt werden. Und dann darf keine Abwehrreaktion entstehen, sondern vertrauensbildend muss reagiert werden. Der zweite große Part ist das Strafverfahren an sich. Polizistinnen und Polizisten, insbesondere aus den Landeskriminalämtern, in den Ermittlungsdienststellen, haben eine ganz spezielle Rolle im Strafverfahren. Die gilt es durchaus auch sehr streng auszuleben in der Frage von belastendem und entlastendem ähm, Material für das Strafverfahren vorbringen. Aber wir erleben in vielen Beispielen, wenn Polizistinnen und Polizisten ihrer Rolle gerecht werden, können sie parallel Opfern gute Hilfestellung geben. Sie können Beratungsstellen empfehlen, sie können die richtigen Anwälte empfehlen und sie können bei den leider sehr langen Strafverfahren auch Informationsgeber sein. Das ist hier auch angesprochen worden, also erklärend im Verfahren mitnehmen, um Sorgen und Ängste zu nehmen, denn wenn man die Rolle von Opfern in Deutschland annimmt, dann ist die Realität so, dass die Strafverfahren unfassbar lange dauern, dass in den Strafverfahren auch regelmäßig eine zweite Viktimisierung stattfindet, allein durch die Strafprozessordnung und das gerichtliche Verfahren. Und da gilt es, Schutzmechanismen einzubauen, die einfach den Menschen ermöglichen, von Beginn an 
alles Notwendige an die Ermittlungsbehörden zu kommunizieren, damit am Ende auch eine Strafe für einen Menschen erfolgt, der diesen Menschen Unrechtes getan hat. Und damit würde ich schließen wollen, wir Polizistinnen und Polizisten haben einen unfassbar hohen Drang, Verbrecher zu fangen, Menschen zu fangen, die Unrechtes tun. Und dabei sind wir sehr ehrgeizig und haben auch viel Kreativität. Aber durch diese sehr eingeschränkte Rolle fällt es manchmal schwer, sich zusätzlich noch in die Rolle des Opfers zu versetzen. Und dafür kann man, glaube ich, dann nur hier in dieser Runde Respekt zollen, dass das auf den Tisch kommt, dass es angesprochen wird und auch einen Einfluss auf unsere vielseitigen Polizeibereiche hat. Jochen, can I ask in English because of, uh, of the audience two questions? Because I was very curious because I, I, I listened this morning to, um, to our colleague from, uh, from the FBI, Stacey Beers, and she told us that um, victims are in fact volunteers. They arrive in the judicial system for the first time and they meet all kinds of professionals who, don't, who know very well what they want to do and don't want to do and maybe for for two of you, um, Jochen was speaking about the German system where the police had a sort of a double double role and they are more focused on the, on the research uh, in cases than uh, on, on protecting uh, in victims. So I was wondering how you see that because it's a big risk because it's not only that they are volunteers, but they are all most of the time and especially in serious cases, they are traumatized. So normally there are maybe educated and well-known people, but not in the circumstances. Uh, so that's one question, how do you see that? And the second question is, can you tell us a little bit more about your cooperation? Be because you have a worldwide organization, uh, Weiser Ring und Opferhilfe, who are specialized in victim support. And you should think when you don't have the time and maybe not the concentration as a police force to go for the victims, how do you work together? Because I think it's an as extra responsibility if you realize that maybe you can't do it enough. Ich beginne mit der Antwort auf die zweite Frage. Der Weiße Ring und auch andere Organisationen sind existenziell in der Bundesrepublik, um die Rolle für Opfer und Zeugen in Verfahren, aber auch in der Gesellschaft einzunehmen. Und wir treffen dort auf viele engagierte Menschen, und in Teilen auch auf viele engagierte Polizistinnen und Polizisten, die nach ihrer aktiven Zeit oder manchmal auch während ihrer aktiven Zeit parallel sich engagieren, äh, aus den verschiedensten Gründen. Ich vermute, einer der vorrangigsten ist Unzufriedenheit im System, um zu sagen, aber da gibt es so viel mehr. Und der Arbeitsalltag von Polizistinnen und Polizisten ist zurzeit nicht davon geprägt, die Zeit zu haben, einen Fall zu überschauen und zu überlegen, welche Hilfestellung braucht dieser Mensch in dieser besonderen Situation. Und strukturell können die Polizeibehörden das im Moment auch nicht ermöglichen. Also gibt es viel Aufgabe für Organisationen wie den Weißen Ring, aber auch Victim Support Europe und auch Anwaltsvereinen, die am Ende dazu beitragen, ein durch die Gesetzgebung vorgeschriebenes Strafverfahren so zu verändern, dass den meisten und auch vielen Beteiligten Rechnung getragen wird. Man darf auch Straftätern bestimmte Rechte zusprechen, aber das Opfer darf in einem Strafverfahren niemals untergehen, nicht die Beachtung finden. Und deshalb ein Stück weit zur ersten Frage. Wenn man mit vielen Opfern zu tun hat, dann macht das was mit einem Menschen, das heißt, es muss natürlich ein Hilfsangebot in den eigenen Polizeien geben, um das Thema Bewältigung von, ähm, von Straftaten im eigenen irgendwie zu verarbeiten. Aber viel wichtiger ist ein polizeilicher Grundsatz, Vorbereitung, Durchführung, Nachbereitung. Wer sich die Zeit nimmt, bei einem abgeschlossenen Fall noch einmal zusammenzukommen, zu sagen, was lief gut, was lief schlecht, und Perspektiven einnimmt, die nicht üblich sind, wie zum Beispiel die Opferrolle oder Dritte mit einbeziehen. Nur der kann am Ende des Tages Verbesserungen bewirken. 
Und im Moment sind die Polizeien durch die gewachsene, gestiegene Kriminalitätszahl und andere Schwerpunktsetzungen durch die Innenministerien nicht auf dem Weg, sich zu verbessern, sondern nur Herr zu werden, was passiert. Und dafür muss man wieder den Community-Policing-Ansatz finden. Wenn eine Behörde das nicht schafft, es gibt viele Player, viele Menschen drumherum, die aktiv sind, die sich einbringen wollen, immer mit dem hehren Ziel, in der Bundesrepublik nicht Opfer zu werden. Nicht Opfer von Straftaten oder von anbahnenden Straftaten, sich frei zu bewegen, egal welcher, ähm, welchem Geschlecht man angehört oder welcher Weltvorstellung. Das Credo der Bundesrepublik Deutschland ist, man muss sich hier sicher fühlen können und dafür hat der Staat über das Grundgesetz auch die Aufgabe, dem Herr zu werden. Das tut der Staat nicht in allen Punkten, das ist höchst bedauerlich, weil wir gerade bei Communities erleben, die sich trauen, die jetzt rauskommen und sagen, mein Leben ist bunt und schön, dass in vielen Bereichen der Staat in seiner Struktur noch nicht so weit ist, die richtigen Antworten zu geben. wondering if we can have a discussion later on if a society is given time to wait before we have organized it i don't think that society will wait for it and you see in i think that's also in your case um, that victims stand up and don't want to wait anymore and l lose trust in the system and i think that's a very um, dangerous development but we keep it uh, for later on but um, i think I come to you, John. Uh, uh, can I give you to, the floor to, to speak with us about more your, your experience about safe reporting? What can you do in, in practice, maybe in a special case for, uh, for victims, and how do you do it in different states of the United States? Yes. Yeah, so safe reporting is, is critically important for victims, obviously. Uh, in, in the U.S., generally, that starts with um, a report to the local police. Now, uh, we, while we have federal agencies, we don't have a national police. So there are tens of thousands of law enforcement agencies in the United States at the municipal level, county level, state level, national level. Um, but generally, uh, the first report is to whatever local police has jurisdiction. Uh, and that may be a small department. Actually, about 80% of agencies in the United States are under 25 officers, so they're generally very small, and they work together with other agencies to provide services. Uh, but uh, they, they may or may not have a good reporting mechanism. Generally, it's a call to the emergency number, 911 in the United States, or, or a non-emergency number. Uh, and it starts with uh, a patrol officer who uh, starts an investigation and fills out a report, then it goes through investigators and so on and so forth. Um, there are other, uh, other avenues in some cities where a report can be made to, um, for example, a domestic violence shelter, uh, if, if that's the topic, or another uh, NGO or other third party organization that can then report to the police. That's not common, but it is in some of the larger cities or areas where they have other resources. Um, so if it starts with the police, then the police has to have some method to report that safely. Generally, when you call 911, the police will go to wherever you are. Um, and if that's your home and that's where the violence or the, the crime occurred, well, maybe that's not a safe place. So there are many times where victims will go somewhere else and report to a different um, uh, uh, in, 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 in a way that uh, they feel safer because now they're maybe at a relative or a friend or a neighbor or something like that. If that's in the same jurisdiction, the same city or county, then generally that will work. Part of the problem, though, in our fragmented system is if a victim leaves his or her home and goes to a relative that's in a different city or a different county, well, there's generally a different law enforcement agency that has to respond to that. And they may or may not have legal jurisdiction to take that report and commence that investigation. So um, that, that doesn't negate the fact that people should still call and report, but it's incumbent upon that agency to which the crime is reported to work with the agency who has jurisdiction of where it occurred. 
because the, the investigation and the prosecution uh, is generally done in the jurisdiction where the crime occurred. Now, when it's a federal crime, that makes it so much easier because you know, they, have, they have jurisdiction throughout. Uh, some, even some state agencies may or may not have jurisdiction depending on what type of agency they are. Uh, so it's, it, it, it makes sense to us, but it doesn't make sense to folks who come from a country with a national police, so, so we, under, we understand that. Um, but safe reporting is, is critically important. So again, it's incumbent upon the agency to have that mechanism and have that cooperative relationship so that victims can report crime in, in a way that protects not only their physical well-being, but their rights and, and so on. Um, and so moving on from that, what, what happens next? Well, there, there will be this investigation. Uh, in, in, some, in some agencies, that's done by the responding patrol officer. In other agencies, agencies it's done by a general investigator. In some larger agencies, it's a, a specific investigator who you know, maybe handles only robbery cases or only rape cases or only homicide cases or so on. Um, so they're very good at what they do because that's, you know, that's their, their entire responsibility. Um, there are legal systems in most states where you can, uh, a, a victim can go to a court and, uh, and obtain a restraining order or an order of protection. They're called different things in different states. Uh, but that generally uh, starts from uh, the initial investigation. And one of the things that the, the officer is supposed to do is let victims know about their rights. Most every state in the United States has a crime victim bill of rights codified into statute, into law. And officers need to, uh, uh, to advise victims of what that contains. Most agencies will do that with a pamphlet or a leaflet or something like that, maybe in a variety of languages, or they'll have interpreters available. Uh, but just about on every crime, that, that uh, resource is left with the victim. Hopefully it's a reference where they can look back on it because the trauma of victimization, they're not maybe necessarily uh, um, thinking about that at the time or understanding what is said so they can refer back to that. There's generally a case number, an investigating officer's name, a phone number for which they can get information and so on. Uh, and in, in, in that is generally a process about how do you obtain a restraining order or an order of protection. That has to go to a court. It takes time. It's on generally during business hours. Some states will have an after hours process, but that's not very common. Uh, so if it's, you know, you victimize in the middle of the night, you have to wait till the next business day when court is open. Holiday weekends, things like that, it can take time. Uh, so there, there generally is some other system within the agency to provide a little bit of extra protection, although it's not guaranteed. It's not like they'll post a police officer in front of the home or, or whatever. Um, they will alert other officers, patrol uh, around the clock, uh, um, a process called special attention where uh, officers will ride by a little more frequently and, and those kind of things. But, but there is no guarantee with that. Uh, in some cases, victims uh, who meet certain criteria can be removed to a shelter. For example, a domestic violence shelter is, uh, is one of those, if there is one in that community or a neighboring community. But those aren't uh, always available, and sometimes they're at capacity. So it's, it's kind of a patchwork, but most communities have a system uh, to deal with that. And, and it, what it has to really be based upon is relational policing. Too often, what we do in law enforcement is transactional. We respond to a call, we investigate a crime, we make an arrest, we write a citation for a traffic violation, something like that. It's a transaction. And what we're trying to help officers understand that in, it, while there is a transaction that takes place, it's still a relational interaction there's still an opportunity to relate to people in whatever the circumstance is, um, to understand their perspective, to communicate, uh, to advocate, all those kind of things. And, and when we do that, we look at the bigger picture of, well, this victim needs help now. How do I provide that? Uh, I, I mentioned uh, uh, about law enforcement-based victim advocacy. And, and where that is important, uh, it provides an opportunity 
for a victim advocate to respond to the scene that knows that police officer, knows the policy, knows the jurisdiction, knows the, uh, what is available uh, through the agency, through the prosecutor's office, through the court system. Um, and in certain cases, they will respond, middle of the night, weekend, so on and so forth. Uh, and, and other NGOs do that as well, but, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of, uh, of where this, this was important. Um, and, and I also mentioned earlier that a law enforcement-based victim advocate can intervene earlier in the system, uh, earlier in the process, even before there is a prosecutable case. So I had a case a number of years ago where um, one of my officers responded to a verbal altercation, which is not a crime under the laws of the state I was in at the time. Um, however, our policy was to document and report everything when it came to domestic violence and victimization and so on. And so because of that policy, this report got written, and it was very early in this cycle of violence. Of course, you never know where it's going to go, but you know, history and, and research will show us it, it will likely continue if it's not uh, impacted somehow. This went to the victim advocate. The victim advocate followed up, provided some services, and so on. Um, th this victim then moved out of our jurisdiction and moved about 40 or 50 miles away to another jurisdiction. So fast forward a few months, now this victim is being stalked. And uh, of course we learned, we learned yesterday uh, in the Netherlands you have the uh, stalking and harassment assessment form. We have a similar one, it's called lethality assessment and it asks some of the same questions. And, and so at that point, this victim, not in our jurisdiction anymore, called this victim advocate in my agency because they had a relationship. Um, and this lethality assessment form uh, uh, interview was conducted and the victim advocate now knew, well, there's a severe risk of, of threat to this victim. And even though it was a different jurisdiction where we didn't you know, have the, the authority, we did have the relationship with the other agency. Um, and, and over a, a period of about an hour or two, uh, um, both of our agencies, where it occurred and, and the agency where my agency where I had the victim advocate, were able to communicate, collaborate, and then recognize the immediate threat to this person. Um, and, and it was so immediate that we ended up uh, um, stopping a vehicle with the suspect in it, so her offender, um, who was armed with a rifle with, um, I believe, handcuffs and some other uh, items, tape and, and masks and things like that, who was on the way to abduct her and eventually kill her. Now this, we knew about this because of that relationship that started with a report that he was verbally abusive, and that's all it was. So this, the safe reporting is critically important. The order of protection, the, although some people say that's a piece of paper, that doesn't stop anybody from doing anything. It, it doesn't, but it's something. It's a, it's a measure where someone can be arrested criminally for violating the order of protection where the underlying uh, case may not have been something there where, where we could make a charge. Uh, but ha all of that is so important. Am I in? Yes. Can I ask you a question? And I think it's for all of you. I must say, I, I worked my whole life as a judge. Mm. And we were very satisfied about ourselves till the moment that I arrived in victim support in the Netherlands. Mm. I thought we didn't solve anything because in fact 15% of the cases arrive in court. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of cases arrive at the police station, I think, but 85% uh, never arrives there. There is no evidence, there is no capacity, there is no money, there is nothing. Mm -hmm. And it's critical because we have a nice conference here, but sometimes I think, especially when you look to all the sexual harassment online on this moment and all the international online criminality, mm -hmm. What is our future? Because we, we can sit here and, and, think, and, and think about it, but I think we get more and more disappointed victims uh, who really need help from, uh, from us, but we can't find it in, in the system anymore. And I always think, is it not time that we let the judiciary do what they do? Because I still believe in it. They do the serious cases, but more as example cases and that the police and victim support has to work very strong together, not to bring victims into a system what doesn't give an answer, but try to find a sort of joint solution in a way of restorative justice or whatever. But I don't 
believe anymore because now I, I see victims who I met when I was in court. So these cases are five, six years there in the on the table and there are also six years at the table of the police and six years on the table of the prosecution. So I always learn that justice, uh, quality of justice has also to do with do something in time. So I'm wondering how you think about that and we can't think about a solution but we can think here about alternatives because I don't think that in the coming 10 years we don't get extra policemen, we don't get extra judges and prosecutors, so we have to do something else. Can you say short, because I like to hear from all of you. I, I think we have to change the mindset to recognize the importance of the victim in the entire criminal justice system and recognize that not only are there rights, there, there's, a, there's a moral imperative to serve that victim and, and to, to provide whatever resources we can. And that will look different in different places. But it's not necessarily up to the judiciary to solve the problem. They, they have to adjudicate a case. But as you say, so many cases don't get there. So what do we do in the, in, in the, in the time before that? And I think that's where we need to focus. Yeah, but maybe I think we always talk about the criminal chain, as you know, you know, that start at the police and some um, victim support is in the middle and it ends at the judiciary but maybe we have to work as a word network and say let them stand up who can do serious something. Maybe that's a first step. Uh, I don't know how you see that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Jochen. May I? Yes. Um, ich möchte natürlich nicht, dass Sie die Hoffnung in das System verlieren, auch wenn Sie Teil äh, eines solchen Prozess sind. Aber in Deutschland kann man auch lernen, aus Fehlern lernen, leider durch eine hohe Anzahl an Opfern, insbesondere im, im häuslichen Umfeld, häusliche Beziehungsgewalt. Wir haben rückblickend zur Hochphase der Corona-Pandemie erschreckenderweise festgestellt, dass wenn das öffentliche Leben in Wohnungen stattfindet und nicht mehr draußen, dass zum Beispiel eine bestimmte Kriminalitätsform häusliche Beziehungsgewalt massiv zunimmt und viele Menschen betreffen wird, nämlich alle, die in einer Familie leben, wo schwerste Gewalt ausgeübt wird. Und als die Gesetzgeber in dieser föderalen Struktur erkannt haben, dass zum Beispiel in den Themenfeldern Stalking oder häuslicher Beziehungsgewalt oftmals der Tod das Ende dieser schrecklichen Erfahrung ist, hat man den Polizeien auch Möglichkeiten gegeben. Und was macht Mut? Es gibt Gesetzgebung, die sagt, wer schlägt und Gewalt ausübt, der bleibt nicht in der Wohnung. Also dürfen wir Polizistinnen und Polizisten natürlich sofort jemanden, zum Beispiel in einer Beziehung, Mann schlägt Frau, sofort der Wohnung verweisen. Und das ist auch richtig. Wer schlägt oder Gewalt ausübt, darf ja niemals das Gefühl haben, in meinen Räumen kann ich machen, was ich will. Das darf nicht passieren. Und an diesem Prozess der sogenannten Wohnungsverweisung, ist erst einmal auch der Prozess der zivilen Gerichtsbarkeit geknüpft. Wie schnell bringt man ein Opfer in ähm, die entsprechenden Prozesse? Welche Hilfsangebote? Und das muss Hoffnung machen, dass natürlich Gesetzgebung und die tatsächliche operative Polizeiarbeit am Opfer ausgerichtet sein muss. Und ich finde, das ist für mich, die ich in meiner Polizeilaufzeit auch erlebt hat, wie es war, diese rechtlichen Möglichkeiten nicht zu haben, ein Riesenfortschritt, jemandem die Wohnungsschlüssel wegzunehmen und zu sagen, du verprügelst deine Frau, deine Kinder nicht wieder. 14 Tage treffe ich dich vor der Haustür an, sperre ich dich ein. Und das sind Botschaften, die ein Rechtsstaat mit Menschen aus dem Polizeibereich, die das Gewaltmonopol haben, auch konsequent durchsetzen muss. Denn was wir nie bedenken ist, dass Täter und Täterinnen auch Aufwind bekommen, je länger das Verfahren dauert, machen sie weiter. Und deshalb ist durchaus, nicht nur das Strafverfahren zu verkürzen, auch die sofortigen Interventionsmöglichkeiten, das klare Aufzeigen von Falsch, Konsequenz, das Richtige. Und das ermutigt uns Polizistinnen und Polizisten, dann auch äh, tatsächlich hart vor Ort durchzugreifen. Okay. Um, well, I see it uh, a little bit uh, clear what's what happens, you know, in relation to this question. Um, 
when sometimes even the police don't want it to be a hate crime because it means something very deep that is re recogni recognizing a structural problem of the whole system at the grassroots. So what does it mean when it also uh, come uh, on the court, uh, judges and prosecutors, um, it means a lot of changes, a lot of efforts, a lot of uh, resources. Um, one of the main aims of, this, of the association uh, was to provide and promote training, training. But the most important of all is awareness rising. We, we, want, we want to live in peace. We, we need it to, this is uh, really urgent to be done. More training, more sensitization. From the uh, action plan uh, in the Ministry of Interior, uh, this is now the second action plan against hate crimes. Uh, it is included because we insisted a lot from the association that what was uh, needed to be done. And it is included even the word sensitization, empathy. And this training uh, must go to all the police uh, and law enforcement and also the judges and prosecutors. Uh, at the beginning, in the first, uh, we were only thinking in the police, but then we realized because of the result uh, and the data, the statistics um, that were not even mirroring the reality. The official data is not mirroring the reality. Most of the data uh, is um, collected by the uh, other uh, LGBT associations other uh, organizations uh, not really sharing with the police all this information, just a little bit, and the official data is uh, just not the truth. Uh, and why is this like this? Because uh, most of the hate crimes are not considered finally at the end uh, like they are because uh, they are not taken from the beginning in, uh, when we are placing the reports in the police stations. If you don't have uh, a good training, a good knowledge about diversity, you are not including all the indicators that um, make prosecutors easier, uh, easier the, the, the work because they are also lack of this knowledge. <laughs> and uh, this is what it uh, needed to be done. More training, more sensitization. Also empower the victims, also uh, trust building, uh, so that the victim goes directly to, the, uh, to ask for help to the police and not other organizations. We are losing a lot of uh, victims uh, in the way. And we need them also uh, to increase this awareness, to increase this knowledge, to increase the uh, which is which are the problems, what's going on, what's happening, and something really needed to be done. Uh, the system is not working, is obviously, <laughs> and I would say not all in Spain. <laughs> mostly all over the world. <laughs> so, yes, a lot of changes, a lot of efforts, and uh, we have to look at, to look at the main uh, thing, to the important, what is important. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes and we are talking here on, on the platform, but I was wondering if someone has a very urgent question on this, uh, on this moment, or a remark, or whatever he wants to say. No one? Were we so clear?
or do you like lunch? <laughs> Come on. Okay, then we have some. Yes, ha. Ah. Uh, well, thank you very much for the interesting, uh, interesting discussion. Uh, I'm representing the German NGO network against trafficking in human beings. Uh, hence, uh, I very much appreciated um, the comments from police. But I was wondering, are there special formats uh, that you know of that where police is reaching out to the victim supporting structures, uh, that there is um, regular exchange on how to um, well, best serve the victim's interests together and uh, would those trainings and um, sensitization develop together? And maybe you can also um, explain a little on where there are challenges, if there are. Thank you. Ja, es gibt ähm, spezielle Aus- und Fortbildung und auch Netzwerke. Ähm, Erst einmal ist wichtig für eine Polizeibehörde und die Menschen, die dort arbeiten, zu erkennen, wer ist das Opfer, wie ist der Mensch Opfer geworden, welche Umstände haben dazu geführt. Das heißt, grundsätzlich ist erst einmal wichtig, alle Daten zu erheben, alle Fakten, alle Umstände. Wenn wir wissen, wer Opfer geworden ist und ein Strafverfahren durchgeführt haben und die Ermittlungen laufen, dann gibt es erst einmal strukturiert sowas wie eine Sammelstelle für Probleme, für Rechtsprobleme. Also erst einmal strukturiert die Frage, sind wir in diesem Verfahren nicht weitergekommen, weil das aktuelle Recht und das Gesetz uns hindert, Dinge mehr zu tun. Das ist schon mal ganz wichtig, weil man damit ähm, schon einmal für die Zukunft sich präpariert, um die Gesetzgebung zu verändern. Viel wichtiger ist natürlich am Ende eines Verfahrens, im besten Fall mit Urteilsspruch, weil es dann sozusagen auch ein Stück weit nutzbar wird und nicht mehr beeinflussbar wird, Opfer in einem strukturierten Verfahren zu hören. Das tun wir in der, also Polizeibehörden, in der Regel fast nur über Verbände, NGOs oder mutige Einzelpersonen, die die Stimme für viele sind. Das gilt es zu verbessern, weil das im Moment nicht ausreicht. Es gibt aber natürlich in Gerichtsverfahren und auch über die Justiz durchaus entsprechende Fachtagung. Also es ist schon so, dass sich viele am Prozess Beteiligte zu Recht hinsetzen und sagen, wir machen eine große Veranstaltung, nicht nur um Best-Practice-Beispiele zu finden, sondern zu erkennen, ob erst einmal dieselben Probleme vorliegen und auch sozusagen die gleiche Zielgruppe am Opfer werden. Was es aber nicht gibt, ist die tatsächliche 1 zu 1 Situation, wo nach einem Verfahren zum Beispiel Anwältin, Anwalt mit dem Opfer zur Polizei gehen und sagen, ich habe mal eine Frage, wieso ist an dieser Stelle das nicht gemacht und das nicht gemacht worden. Das wird mittlerweile über die Möglichkeit von beauftragten Stellen durchaus versucht, irgendwie zu erfahren. Es nimmt aber ganz wenig Einfluss auf die tatsächliche Polizeiarbeit. Das heißt, eigentlich muss der weltweite Kurs Opfern mehr Stimme, mehr Gewicht, mehr Möglichkeit der Verbesserung gegeben werden, weil ich ja dargestellt habe, wer in welcher Rolle gefangen ist. Und um es noch komplizierter zu machen, Polizistinnen und Polizisten handeln sogar eher auf Anweisung der Staatsanwaltschaft, also Prosecutors, und sind, haben nicht weniger Verantwortung, aber sind am Ende auch in ein System gezwängt, wo andere über sie bestimmen. Deshalb braucht es eigentlich viel mehr Austausch, und zwar nachhaltigen Austausch mit klar erkennbaren Verbesserungen, als dass das im Moment der Fall ist. John, can you say something how you do that in the United States? Is there a system? I know which. For, at, at, the, uh, at your question, uh, in fact, it's a combination of how is it registered? Do we know who are vulnerable uh, victims? Uh, do we have enough data? Do we share them with all the organizations in the chain? Yeah, I don't think we do. I don't think we have enough data, and I don't think we share it as effectively as we should. I think too many crimes go unreported. Uh, too many victims uh, don't seek assistance for whatever reason, uh, for fear or not knowing the system or having a bad experience with the system. Uh, and so we don't really have uh, a good scope of the problem. 
And um, while I think some communities have very good NGOs and, and very good uh, third party systems to support victims, um, I, I think we need to work a little harder on the partnership and on the collaboration and then on having um, a more uh, consistent network uh, so that it doesn't matter if you're in an urban or a rural area, um, if you're in one state or another, one country or another, um, a victim should have access to those services. And, and I, I don't think we do that as effectively right now as, uh, as we could. And the collaboration, the, the, the cross-pollination of ideas uh, is a wonderful thing that I hear a lot of in the last day and a half. And, and, and I think we need to continue that because there is so much more work that needs to be done. Thank you. Elena, do you want to add something from your perspective? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, five minutes. Um, I wanted to say just... Um, we all together need to do a lot <laughs> uh, in cooperation, in collaboration. We need an, an upstander attitude. So, <laughs> excuse me if I dare to uh, cheer you up. I want all of you up right now. One, two, three. Upstander, please. Upstander attitude. No more bystander anymore. So we are not uh, being just witnesses. We are attacking. We are, we are attacking it. Yeah? Okay? That's all. Thank you all. Um, I think we all agree that we had a lot of work to do, I think. Um, I always think that maybe we'll, we all, as we sit here, but I think in the whole criminal change, we all work too hard. Um, and maybe the solution is that we have to work a little bit smarter. And for me, in that smart system is better cooperation, because I still think that we can divide the work in another way, so that the police can do more policing, the prosecutors can do more prosecution, and we as victim services can serve the victims, and we all can do that in, an, uh, in a smart, uh, smart cooperation. So um, I'm not negative about the system, but I think I always like to, to start to ask the critical questions, because I see we also live in a reality who is not very easy for victims in all of our countries, and especially when you see so many um, good people working that hard, it's very important that we have that in mind. But still, everyone has to be very proud <coughs> of himself, but we all together can do it better, I think. So, a lot of work to do, not for now, because we have a nice uh, lunch till... <laughs> I have to check till, what is it, till three? And, and oh, oh, the icebreaker, Marina, sorry. Hello, <laughs> hello. I decided not to do an icebreak because I think that the ice has already been broken. <laughs> and therefore, thanks, Elena. Uh, just three practicalities. We are going to have lunch right now. They just, what they said, that it's getting cold. And uh, we are not returning anymore to the, this plenary room. So we again after lunch splitting into seven workshops. Seven workshop conductors are kindly asked to come right now to the technical booth to arrange the practicalities. And in the evening, we are all waiting for those who subscribed at Winter Garden Varieté for a beautiful show. Doors open at seven. The dinner is served at eight o'clock. So we are all in time. Thank you.